Welcome to this meeting of the City of York uh, Main Planning Committee uh, on Thursday the 12th of September 2019. Um, I think we have a full house in uh, the number of uh, uh, councillors present, so I have no apologies uh, received. Thank you very much for this full attendance. Uh, and welcome to those who come to be uh, part of this. Uh, some of you may be uh, speaking later. Let me just say that the meeting is being webcast. Uh, if you're sitting uh, on that side of the room, you will, you will not be on camera. But if you do take a seat to address the meeting, you will be, just to warn you of that. Please, if you have a mobile phone, uh, ensure it is at the very least turned to silent, if not switched off. And we're not expecting any fire alarms. Um, so if there is any alarm, we take it seriously. We leave the building and we use this, this door and outside to the front of the hotel. Also at this end for the toilets, should you need them during the course of the meeting, or if you're leaving for any other reason, please don't use the door at that end of the room. You may never be seen again. I'm required to ask if there are any declarations of interest with regard to the items we have on our agenda this afternoon. Councillor Kilbane. Uh, thank you, Chair. Not so much a declaration of interest, just for information for the panel. I was unable to go on site visit on Tuesday, um, so I arranged to go uh, myself uh, yesterday evening, and I asked Dr. Fithian from Friends of uh, Rockland Meadows to give me a guided tour. So I'm familiar with the site with an expert view, just for the sake of full transparency. Thank you. Any other declarations of interest? Okay. Um, we have minutes of two previous meetings, the meetings on the 13th of June and the 2nd of July of this year. The meeting on the 11th of July minutes are to follow. Are you content that I sign those as an adequate record of um, meetings on those dates? Thank you very much. I will do so a little later. We come to public participation and we have uh, two who have registered to speak on matters of uh, general interest and the general remit of planning, so I'm going to invite them in turn to come forward and do that. First of all, uh, Michael Hamill, you've done this before, you know how it works, three minutes, and I'll give you just some, some warning before your time is up. Thank you. Please make sure you put the microphone on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when I last addressed this committee in June, I handed out a chart uh, which highlighted several planning applications which were many months behind their target dates. Uh, three months later, uh, this is still happening. The chart before you lists five of my current application addresses uh, with the planning references and the applicable dates. The worst example is for an earth bund at 26 The Horseshoe, which I submitted in November last year and has taken over nine months with still no decision. Cast your eye down the list and reassuringly, the only application to be decided one day early is for solar panels at Hessington Lane. However, this was refused without any discussion with me or any opportunity to amend the scheme. This flies in the face of national planning policy and your own climate emergency policy. Uh, and I have an email here from you, Councillor Colic, dated the 1st of July, which says that you, uh, there is no policy against renewable energy. Um, so don't the officers appreciate that they are actually contributing to our climate crisis? I ask you all, uh, do you think that this is acceptable? You keep hearing from moaners like me, yet at each planning meeting, you thank the officers for their hard work. And I know that I'm not the only developer facing such opposition and delay. Now, either the officers are inefficient and don't care about their own deadlines, or I'm being victimised for my robust approach to trying to get developments through the system. Either way, ask the senior planning officer present here to explain why so many are delayed and why they are issuing refusals for solar panels on roofs that cannot be seen. Thank you. Two minutes, thank you very much.
Matthew Lavrak. Again, three minutes. Okay, 20 odd years ago, a domestic design guide was introduced for house extensions, drafted by a senior officer called Cliff Carruthers. It reflected his subjective opinion of what extensions should look like. It completely ignored implications of resources and was often impractical on certain projects. However, in those days, it was possible to convince officers that alternative proposals can sometimes be a better option. Unfortunately, what started as a, as a guide has morphed into a rigid requirement where anything that doesn't strictly adhere to the supplementary document now faces rejection. You have a current example in front of you. In order to secure, to secure planning permission without the cost and delay of an appeal, we are forced to adopt the design at the top of the sheet you have, instead of the much simpler and less imposing solution at the bottom of the sheet. This will increase the cost of the extension to my client by at least £10,000. But more importantly, it will massively increase the materials and energy needed to provide the additional accommodation. It requires every single rafter to be cut individually at a special angle. It requires plywood and lead for gutters. It requires tiles to be cut at both the valleys and the hips on every line. All of this consumes significant energy and resources just to satisfy a subjective notion of what all extensions must look like. Now, if you are really serious about climate change and genuinely want to see a reduction in carbon emissions, there must be a radical overhaul of planning policies and supplementary documents. There must also be a change in the attitude of those officers who have a negative mindset and are un unwilling to consider alternative solutions. That is all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Again, that was just two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Lavra. <laughs> Thank you both for those contributions. We're going to come to the uh, plans list for this afternoon. Two items on the plans list, but as those two items are so, so closely related, we'll uh, discuss them as, as one, even though we may, of course, uh, be required and will uh, subsequently vote on each separately when the time comes. So, can we have an update, please? Um, if I just briefly um, explain the uh, scheme and then we can uh, do the uh, committee update. So this is the full extent of the uh, application site. Um, you can see the, um, the existing embankment is in this area here. Um, that falls within the uh, Clifton Ings and Rockliffe Meadow Triple SI. Um, the works will affect 2.3 hectares of grasslands with, within the Triple uh, SI. Um, the cornfield is here. It's proposed that the site access comes through here uh, and there'll be a site compound in there. The um, cornfield was established in 2000 um, as mitigation for development of Rockliffe Bar Park and Ride. And it provides arable habitat, um, which is there to uh, maintain population of farmland birds and other wildlife. Um, the works are to repair and reprofile the existing bank and also extend it at both ends. So that entails um, an extension through the cornfield uh, and then it would lower, um, but it would also extend here in the uh, Rockcliffe Bar uh, Country Park. The extension at the other end would run, it would involve uh, reprofiling uh, and an extension uh, past York Sports Grounds and, a, and a, a boundary wall would be added right at, right at this end, um, close to the park. Um, 
So the proposals involve um, those changes to the barrier bank, uh, a pumping station that, that would be here that would have permanent pumps. Uh, the area here is um, Rockliffe Meadow Sink. Uh, the area over here in, in the green is Rockliffe Things. Uh, this is the area where proposed uh, mitigation is in terms of tree planting uh, and where the proposals are for the replacement grassland. Um, in terms of the uh, committee update, um, we've just uh, got some clarification on the uh, on the proposals for the Sustrans route and how the intention is uh, for there to be a temporary route uh, down at this south end. Uh, the hope is that that will become the permanent route rather than it being uh, with, within the barrier bank. That's subject to uh, landowner consent. We've, we've set out the SSSI compensation in terms of the areas that are to be compensated for uh, where, they would, where they would be. That shows how the, the embankment, uh, the environment agency, have, when they initially put the application in, it was on the basis of the worst case scenario. So uh, the, the works are assuming a one, one to four replacement for 1.2 hectares, um, but uh, the, the impact could actually be less um, than 1.2 hectares. Um, in terms of decision making, it's just to flag up with members that um, the Secretary of State have been in touch with us on the application and they've asked to be informed of, of the decision at committee. Um, we, we don't know yet as to whether it's their intention to call in the application if members are, are minded to approve it. Um, we received a further representation uh, from Dr McPithian uh, following the committee site visit the other day. Uh, so I've just listed the key issues that he's raised in that letter and a, and a summary of them and they raise issues around the uh, future future management and responsibility uh, for implementing the mitigation strategy and uh, question marks as to why of the as to why one of the alternative options which would have less impact on the triple si was not uh, was not the preferred option and that's the extent of the update ones. Thank you very much. Do members have any questions they want to put at this point? Councillor Kilbane. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just in relation to that um, question around the third party land and the triple SI, in 4.21 of the, of the report, um, essentially uh, the third party land is given more weight than the Triple SI, and I was just wondering what the thinking was behind that decision. Uh, 4.21, page 38 on my printout. I think it's maybe one for the EA to help us to address because they've been through an options appraisal that has, uh, and that there, are, there are multiple various reasons why um, they've chosen to, to do the do the development as they as they have, uh, and and in particular where they've picked the uh, for the site access to go and the, and the access to the works. Um, but so the, the, I th think one of the things for us that even if you I guess. Where is around that there's a lot of wet side extension of the bank in this in this area. Does that does that sound right? And the query is why why it couldn't be dry side on here. Um, but f from our point of view, we would still we've got the access over here, um, and we'd there'd still be in, there'd still be damage to the triple SI in terms of the working area, um, regardless of where the uh, whether whether there was wet or dry side improvements here. But the, yeah, as I say, the EA can explain more thoroughly as to and go into detail as to why they chose again securing this particular piece of land to do the uh, do the works. Thank you very much, Councillor Colbain. You may well want to ask that question later when we have the opportunity. I think you're indicating, yeah. Councillor Public. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a number of, uh, of questions of, um, of, of officers, uh, not necessarily you, Jonathan, but um, paragraph 3.13, um, page 22, it mentions that um, the work done here will permanently um, increase the risk of flooding to the car park on Frederick Street and residential properties on Marygate. A, do we have any indication um, of how many properties on Marygate um, will be permanently um, at risk of increased flooding? Is it more or less or the same as the numbers that will be um, supported by this application? Steve Ragg, uh, City of York Council, Flood Risk Manager. Um, the exact amount, the quantum of properties would need to be confirmed by the Environment Agency. Um, the Environment Agency have identified that in the future climate change scenarios, there will be an area of Frederick Street Car Park and that, that Marigate area that would be at increased risk. So it's a future risk. It's not a risk, you know, in the, in, you know, in the short term, immediately after this defence was built. And also, although we're supposed to look at this in isolation, um, if you consider the programme that the Environment Agency is taking forward, you know, they do talk about the mitigation there. But the exact amount, I think the EA would need to confirm. But you, you can put it in a wider context with some of the arguments that the agency have put in their application, I would say. Can I just ask a supplementary to that, then? Um, the the future mitigation works around Marygate, let's say, in particular, um, that's not been approved. We don't know when that will be, um, and we don't know what the assessment of the risk to the properties in Marygate would be of this development. I is that what I can read from your comments? Uh, no, there's nothing approved. Um, but the scheme is well on in development. There's been an assessment across the whole piece in, in York and look at the cumulative impact of raising defences throughout the city and look to see what each individual scheme, as it comes forward, as it comes to planning committee or permitted development as necessary, and those uplifts of future flood levels from that constraining of future flood levels mm -hmm. will be built into those schemes. Um, so, you, you're completely correct, Councillor. You know, the Planning Commission is not there, the schemes have not been brought before this committee yet. But, from my role on you know, the wider works that the agency is doing, I am aware that they are building in those future flood risk increases into, into those projects. Mm. But clearly, they need to get Environment Agency um, national sign off, but they also get, they need to get relevant planning permissions as well. Thank you. I think that's also a question for the EA when they come to speak. Thank you, Councillor Pavlovic. I'm sure you will raise that question a little later. Councillor Waters, you have a question. Uh, just in relation to that, Steve, um, and this, this transference of flood risk, does the flood risk team still stand by the statement that Richard Wells made into the planning file on the 30th of July that the raising of the embankment, embankment will not provide the additional flood protection it aims to provide? Um, the Environment Agency have subsequently provided a, um, an addendum to pull together all of the existing information that was spread throughout a range of documents, the environmental impact assessments, the flood risk assessments, um, and I think the comments made on that original submission that you referred to, Councillor, I think they talked about that potential that it doesn't resolve the surface water flood risk, it talked about that transference of risk. It didn't take that wider information that was spread throughout those different documents and, and the work that I've just referred to from uh, Councillor Pavlovich's question fully into account. It was, it, it was talking about one side of the equation, but it wasn't talking about all of the positives either. So I think our, our response is, 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 is was wider than purely what was put on file at that time. Seeing as we've got a council engineer now sat, sat in the hot seat, um, this issue of other options that's been discounted, apparently, um, just from a simple perspective, 
I would have thought the option of sheet piling the embankment would have negated a lot of the damage to the triple SI, which does page upon page upon page detailing all that damage and the mitigation strategies. Why has such an engineering operation been discounted? Because presumably a lot of the work could then have taken place from the dry side. I would hope it's not just a cost consideration on behalf of the Environment Agency that's discounted that. I just wonder if there's any other reasons. It's a question for the Environment Agency, Councillor Waters, to be honest. Um, they have a very detailed assessment that looks at the, the metric, matrices of all of the different environmental, economic, social, different indicators that, that lead them to their optimum solution. The Environment Agency will need to talk you through that. Um, but it's not just a case of the cheapest or most expensive that might avoid all impacts. It, it's, it's about the most. It's, it's about it's an economic scheme that will actually get the funding to go forward, and that's that's what you know the environment agency has to put forward because they have to show that the scheme is cost beneficial to actually get the money in the first place. So it, it's it, they've got a wide process which you'll need to ask them about them personally. But it, it's also a scheme that's economic to take forward. But just going back to that, as an independent person overseeing this, sheet piling would be an effective method of in increasing flood protection in this area. It has been used elsewhere in Yorkshire, yes. If there are... Oh, OK. Please do. Uh, this is a question for the ecologist. Um, just wanted to give you the heads up there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, can I take you to paragraph 3.66, um, page 31? This is part of the objection um, comments, and I just really want your opinion on whether you, you would concur or disagree with, um, with it. 3.66 reads, loss of grassland and lack of confidence in the proposed mitigation. This, is habit, this habitat cannot be just replaced elsewhere as mitigation. If ground conditions are right and species rich grassland can be created elsewhere, it will take years, but it's highly unlikely it will be, ever be successful. Is that, is, is that your view? I appreciate that further on in the report you talk about the timescales for mitigation. Uh, so I'm Nadine Rolls, I'm the Council's Countryside and Ecology Officer. Um, the mitigation and compensation is quite a complex picture as you probably picked up from the committee report. Um, and there is some uncertainty in whether it will be successful or not. Uh, the recreation of species rich grassland, particularly of this floodplain meadow, um, needs quite specific conditions and quite specific inputs. Um, so the EA proposed a range of different options, which include translocation of turfs directly from the flood bank, um, and then also green hay spreading and direct seeding from the existing seed bank in the SSSI, um, and then a long-term commitment to changing the management. Um, so that would be an annual hay cut, taking off the arisings, um, and then aftermath grazing, which is how the rest of the triple site is currently managed. Um, and also other inputs like weed control. Um, but uh, it's correct in thinking that it, this is a very long-term process and it could take 20 to 30 years before we know whether it's been really successful. Um, so that adds a, a lot of uncertainty to it. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Can I ask a further question on that? Councillor Waters. What, what has been briefly described there uh, sounds to me quite ambitious, and I would be interested to know if this is tried and tested. Are there examples of similar things having been successful elsewhere, or is this, as it were, untested? 
Um, it's a bit of a mixed picture. It has been tested elsewhere, but there hasn't necessarily been the academic research into the success of um, schemes. Quite often schemes are done, but then the long-term monitoring hasn't taken place. So there's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, there's an organisation called the Floodplain Meadows Partnership, and they've done some quite detailed work into that, and they have advised the Environment Agency on their mitigation. Um, there is an example at uh, Rawcliffe Meadows, which the, the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadow have done um, some grass and recreation, but it was under slightly different conditions where they stripped back all of the top soils, so taking off the top nutrients. Um, and this has some quite intensive management from the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadow over a very long period of time. Um, and that's developed a very good species-rich grassland, but it, their long-term monitoring has shown it's still developing, it's still changing. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed picture. There, have, there aren't that many examples. And I, you probably said that I didn't catch. What is, what's the time scale on the work you've just described? So the one that the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadows, and Dr. Fidian can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about 25 years they've been working on that bit of land. Um, but yeah, generally the, the guidance is it's been sort of 20 to 30 years to get into good condition, but it can be up to 100 years. Thank you. I, I think there may still be one or two other questions. Uh, Councillor Waters and Councillor Pavlovic again. I think anybody that's actually been on site um, late May, early June will testify to the quality of this meadowland, grassland down there. Um, but I'd just like you to confirm that it is of national importance and we are today being asked to sacrifice 10% of that for this scheme permanently. Uh, yeah, you're correct. It, it is nationally important. That's why it's designated as a triple SI. Um, and it's a very specific type of floodplain meadow grass, which is this MG4, which uh, in particular on this site occurs alongside the flood bank. So um, it's not necessarily easy to directly compare it with the wider site, which is quite large. Um, I'm not sure if the figure of 10% is correct. I'd have to yeah, check that. So it's 10% 10, it's 10 of the... MG4 grassland within the triple SI. Um, but it does, yeah, it's gonna, it will impact on the national resource. Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I take you to page 39? Um, oh, you're on it. Um, well done. Um, it says, officers' opinion is that there will be a significant effect at a national level, and, and, and that's the response you've just made. There is uncertainty in the success of habitat creation and restoration with time taken um, to reach target condition in the tens of years, and only then with long-term effort in management and monitoring. You, you've mentioned Friends of Rawcliffe Meadow and the work that they've done. Uh, they've indicated that this, um, this project um, will result in their becoming unviable. How, how much intensive work, the, the management plan of this um, mitigation, what's that going to involve? I mean, can it be as simple as um, contracting out to um, a local farmer or... Um, uh, a, a contractor or does it need intensive specialist work? Um, I'd suggest that it needs more than just um, a kind of general landscaping contractor, it's quite a specialist um, type of work, though the kind of the fundamental management is a farming practice, so the, the hay cut and removal, mm. um, because there's going to be quite a lot of monitoring needed, um, so detailed botanical monitoring um, and mapping um, and then additional tweaks and the, uh, the weed control is going to be a big part of that. It's going to need not necessarily always specialists, but certainly time intensive, regular checking and monitoring and adjusting as well. Cool. Thank you. A brief question myself and then I'll come, come to you if that's okay. Would that involve, I'll rephrase that, to what degree would that involve resources and commitment from the City of York Council? Well, um, as you can see, we've recommended about eight conditions relating to ecology, um, a number of 
detailed mitigation and monitoring strategies will obviously need to be approved by the council, so I will probably work with the EA to develop those. Um, and then there would be probably some long-term input in terms of um, some overview um, that that was being achieved. This, this sounds fairly intensive in terms of resources over a considerable period of time. This might be an unfair question, but do you feel that has been allowed for adequately in the paperwork we have before us? I'll come in there. Okay. <laughs> That's a difficult question, simple answer to that one. In an ideal world, we probably would want to secure some kind of funding to assist with that because, as everybody knows in this room, we don't have an infant an indefinite resource. It's, I only have Nadine as my only ecology officer within the service, within the council. It's, it, it's not a big resource and in that it, it, will, it will cause a resource issue potentially. That, that's the only answer that I can give at this moment in time, but we have said that we will work with the Environment Agency through the conditions, but yes, it would, it would have an impact. Thank you. Councillor Waters. Just moving away from the um, potential loss of nationally important uh, grassland. I just think we ought to turn to page 44 and the edge rows and trees um, impacts. And in particular 4.52 and 4.53, um, it's all very well, well and good talking about planting three trees where one's removed, but where are you actually going to plant them? And I think officers have actually highlighted there is a risk that it will not be possible to fully develop, deliver the proposed mitigation worst case resulting in a net loss of trees and edge rows and I think we've all had the seen the objection from tree menders and it does rather fly in the face once again of um, the vast majority of the council's support for this climate emergency business. I just wonder what the officers comments are as to the mitigation strategy and whether it is deliverable or not because you can't simply plant trees where you're trying to restore the meadowland. Um, so that is the uncertainty in it, in it that um, the EA have um, proposed a good level of mitigation for the loss of tree and hedgerows, but there's some uncertainty about where it would be possible to do that. Uh, one of the most significant losses of hedgerows is um, alongside the Clifton Park Hospital. Does it? Along this stretch here, um, that's quite a long stretch of hedgerow, which... Um, the EA um, has committed to retaining where possible um, and replanting where possible, um, but there are constraints around that in that um, one of the engineer requirements is not to have vegetation planted within so far of the toe of the bank for maintenance purposes. Um, and also I think there's a Yorkshire water main along that side which may prevent the replanting. So though there's a commitment to do it, there still remains some uncertainty. Um, and particularly because there's, there's still the detailed design to be done. I mean, the EA will be able to comment on this, but I understand that until they um, actually have a contractor on board, um, there's some refinement that needs to be done in the detailed design where, where that would be. Thank you. I, I don't see anybody else indicating they have questions to ask, so um, thank you very much. We're going to move to uh, the public speakers who've registered to um, contribute and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. McPithian to uh, please come to, uh, again, three minutes. Uh, I'm sure you could speak for rather longer but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a say. We'll be kind to you. Um, YNET took on the management of what is now Rawcliffe Meadows at the request of the then National Rivers Authority in 1990. So almost three decades of work have gone into transforming the once poached pasture covered in creeping thistle into a triple SI. In that time we have received minimal support and maximum obstruction from the Environment Agency. 
We're also aware of the effects of flooding. A number of our volunteers have been flooded. What these two planning applications by the Environment Agency are noticeable for is not the amount of content, but the lack of information upon which to base the decision. How many people have taken the time to consider the supposed option appraisal provided? If they had, they would have found it to be rigged with little consideration to avoiding the dry side development. We carried out FOI requests to determine what consultation the EA had done with landowners on the dry side. None. So the intention has always been to develop on the rare triple SI grassland. If members approve these applications, they are undermining guidance that is there to protect triple SIs nationally and will likely open the proverbial floodgates to triple SI destruction elsewhere. And on this basis, we have asked the Minister to call in the application should members approve it. Another key element that is missing from all these reports, and that includes the Council and Natural England, is the very existence of the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadows. Where do form fit in all this after the decision has been made, as we aren't considered anywhere? We coordinated those 26,000 hours of work that people gave voluntarily that made the site what it is. To date, nearly 100,000 has been spent recovering and maintaining the area. There is no consideration of future funding or whether there is even a role for form. The report states that Natural England has proposed the establishment of a management committee of interested parties, but that it could not be secured through a planning condition due to complications in making it enforceable, which is not statement considering it is common practice and was done for Clifton Backes some years ago. Those friends of Rawcliffe Meadows present at a meeting in November 2018 agreed that we do not wish to be involved in any mitigation where we consider the proposals inadequate, inappropriate or underfunded. As a planning application stands, the proposals are exactly that, and there is nothing in any of these documents about how the remaining parts of the site will be managed and funded into the future. 30 seconds. Councillors should defer any decision on both applications until all documents required by Natural England and the Council Ecologists have been provided, examined and approved, a, legal, a legally binding agreement on the Environment Agency has been drafted, the EA and COYC agree to the establishment of a body to oversee the site as proposed by Natural England, and an independent person or persons should examine the EA's option appraisal in detail. A superficial examination reveals it to be flawed and weighted in favour of the EA's desired easier route. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, if you would, just wait a moment longer. I would be surprised if there aren't some questions from members of the committee. Councillor Waters. Um, you obviously felt the need to email the committee members about this option appraisal and you mentioned it a couple of times just now. Um, why do you feel so strongly about that? Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm drawn to what I mentioned a few minutes earlier about you know, the other engineering options that might have not have been so environmentally destructive. Well, we've never been consulted about the route in the period of supposed consultation. Uh, the obvious thing is the land to the east, uh, the third party land, well actually some of that is actually owned by the city council. Uh, it was section 106 land from the Clifton Hospital development that's been la lying idle since 1996. Uh, we were actually after that land uh, to use to rescue cattle in case of flood, but no, it's still landing, you know, standing idle. The EA have been informed about the land, the council have been informed about the land, that it could be used potentially as part of this, but no, the EA have avoided it. Other options, sheep piling has been in there, but if you examine the actual spreadsheet with the options on, suddenly numbers are given pluses and minuses that are slightly irrational and inconsistent. So, yes, we're not impressed. Given all the talk about mitigation strategies, um, and the fact that you've been involved there for 30 years, I just wondered what your, your past experience of working with the Environment Agency in terms of logistical support or financial support has been for the last three decades. 
Well, as I think I said, it's not been good. Uh, for one example, in 2008, we took over the Copse Meadow, which is an area to the north of the main meadow. Uh, since that date, we've had no lease on the land. We've been maintaining it at the cost of that we've, the, the money we're getting from Natural England for the rest of the site. Uh, the EA wouldn't allow it to go into stewardship in 2012, which meant we got no funding by Natural England for it. We've regularly asked for funding, say around 2,000 a year, just to pay for management of it, and nothing ever happens. It's in a similar manner, uh, just trying to get the other thing. In more or less exactly a year ago, uh, our bee bank that's in the middle of the cornfield, uh, we suddenly found out some workmen had been on and covered it in steel mesh. Now this had been constructed with volunteer effort, ourselves, university students, money from Bug Life, the urban buzz project. Uh, it was all doing very well, but then somebody decided to nail, nail battens and steel mesh all over it. It's one thing we'd try to avoid because if anything's going to deter invertebrates, that is. Uh, we've now got punctures in the lining below it. We were never consulted, and nor was the landowner, because I checked, because the landowner is actually the City of York Council. It's not good. They do what they want, and we just get ignored. Okay. One last question, and um, it just related to what Nadine said about the... Um replacement tree planting and replacement hedgerow planting. Given your knowledge of the site, would it be possible um, for these replacement trees and lines of hedgerows to go in as replacements without compromising any future um, meadowland mitigation? Uh, we, we've spent many years planting trees and creating hedgerows where they were viable. Uh, the issue now is that uh, particularly the areas at the toe on the, the dry side uh, they'll be largely disappearing as will Bluebeck Cops which we've been managing and which is habitat to uh, the White Letter Hair Street Butterfly on the elm trees will, will disappear to some extent 10 to 20 percent of that will go uh, the problem we have here with these ecology summaries that are being thrown about is that they're seeing species in isolation. The hedgerows and the grassland respect each other. The invertebrates that inhabit those areas reflect each other. It's, it's an ecosystem. What we're being taught, told about now, oh, trees, grassland, everything has to go together. The wetlands, it's all part of a system. What's being missed is the system. And just to add a little bit of information there, grassland of this type is one of the biggest carbon sequestering facilities in existence. Wildflower meadows add more car absorb more carbon than most other things, including trees. Councillor Douglas. Um, it says here that uh, your agri-environment funding is at risk from Natural mm. England. Could you give a bit more detail as to why uh, that's the case, what you've been told about that? Program? Yeah, uh, our agri-environment, the countryside stewardship, which we've, we've depended on for most of the last 30 years, we were one of the original schemes, uh, covers the whole site. And it's one agreement. Natural England, when being confronted with what's being proposed, uh, decided that the easiest way to sort this out was that uh, the moment the Environment Agency stick a shovel into, say, the cornfield, which was going to be the first piece of work, they would declare force majeure on the contract or the agreement, and that was it. So our funding ends. So we get six to seven thousand pounds a year for maintaining the whole site including those bits that we don't have a lease on 
and that's going to go. Nothing else has been offered. Uh, the EA will say, oh, well, you can put a claim in under the uh, Water Resources Act 1991. We're volunteers. We shouldn't have to go cap in hand, as we are currently doing every few months, to try and get the money they promised us. Thank you. Uh, so does that mean then that whole, the whole site will not be maintained any longer? The, the whole site should will not be funded, yeah. and as such, I don't see why we should maintain it. Thank you. Councillor Kilbane. Um, thanks. Um, can I, just for clarification then, you know, well, well, first of all, you know, somebody that's used um, this route um, and this space for many years, big thanks to the friends of Auckland Meadows for um, what you've achieved. You must, have, you must be very proud of your triple SI um, status. Just, just for clarification, are you saying this whole site that you've maintained for 30 years, the, the, the full grant that you get from all sources to do the work that you do is six to seven thousand pounds per yeah. year. And just a, another supplementary. Um, we, we've heard about the chances uh, of the mitigation methods being a success or not. What, where do you rate the chances of the mitigation methods being successful? Very low. Uh, it's only through intensive work, and I mean that's a lot of manual effort, as the council's ecologist described. I mean she's seen it in progress. Uh, as an example, that Cops Meadow that we started 2008, hours and hours of hand weeding, spot spraying, planting pot plants, uh, when you're initially taking, when you've got grassland that's enriched, which uh, broccoli things are, uh, the only way to take out that enrichment is to do multiple cuts. And so we're not talking about, we'll do a cut in the summer, normal hay cut. Uh, when, we were manage, when we were converting part of the cornfield into grassland, we were doing eight or nine cuts for the first two years. You know, that's a lot of financial commitment. And then you've got to get rid of the arisings because necessarily they're not it's not hay so there's a lot of intensive effort and again as the ecologist said it's monitoring it's looking for where the flowers are occurring if they are occurring and if not why not there's a lot of unknowns in this field uh, it could be down to the soil I mean over on Clifton Ings Clifton Ings has never been anything other than uh, hay meadow for a thousand years plus. The soil has developed as such. Rawcliffe Meadows, 400 years perhaps, because it was arable at some stages in its past. Uh, that's shown by the ridge and furrow that cuts in various areas of the site. But it's had 400 years of meadow management. So when we came along in 1990, first control the weeds, which we did by spraying off, but then, you know, just keep removing the arisings until we reduce the enrichment. And then the flowers came back, but it had never been had fertilizer on, it hadn't been ploughed by mechanically, by a tractor, it hadn't had too much weight put on it, so it recovered. Rawcliffe Ings is a completely different beast. Uh, thanks. Sorry, and just, just one other thing. You've, you've asked the members to defer the decision until um, certain documents are published. What, what documents are those? Uh, there's the one thing about this application, because I'm saying it's lacking information, uh, the mitigation strategy has gone through two versions, and Natural England is still requesting documents that weren't supplied. I mean, for example, the Tansy Beetle mitigation strategy. I mean, this is a bit strange. I mean, the, the site is a triple SI for the MG4 grassland and the tansy beetle. To date, the Environment Agency have really only sub, sub, submitted mitigation proposals for the MG4 grassland. 
Uh, they've been asked twice, seven appeared, uh, and it's one of the several documents, but it's also how the documents that Nadine, the Council's ecologist and Natural England have asked for, how this work, this mitigation work, is going to be carried out for the next 20, 30 years, next century, who's going to ensure that it's funded. Uh, it's all very good start doing things, but if the weeds aren't controlled and, you know, the arising's removed, uh, things go downhill very quickly. And so the, there's a whole list of documents that, that are in the, the application, but I think they need to be seen and approved first, because to date, the documents that have been provided are poor. I don't see anybody else indicating, so thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your, uh, your, your very helpful responses. It's much appreciated. Um, we have others who have registered to speak, and the next of those is the trustee of Clifton Alliance Cricket Club, Bob Taylor. Would you like to come and, again, three minutes, I will just give you the nod. Thank you. I, okay. I think I'm still switched on. Yes, I'm Robert Taylor. I'm one of three trustees of Clifton Alliance Cricket Club, um, a club which um, is totally separate, I want to point out, from uh, York Sports Club. There's been some confusion there. We own the ground on which we play cricket and have done so since 1994. Um, we are very much community-based. Um, we have something of the order of 200 junior members, mainly, again, from the Rawcliffe and Clifton community, ranging from under nines through to under 15s. We have four senior teams. The first team plays in the Yorkshire Premier League North, which is the highest league just below county level on the ECB's pyramid structure. The works as currently proposed, the permanent works as currently proposed, actually over the extent of um, the barrier bank adjacent to our ground, the works are shown as being extended to the wet side. We are obviously mainly on the dry side. So the, and the toe of the existing bank is actually very close to our land boundary. So if the works are go ahead as proposed, the permanent works should not affect us as a club. However, as we pointed out on the site meeting on Tuesday, we are concerned that the south site boundary line uh, does actually extend onto our playing area. Now, we have assurances and had assurances at the site meeting that the construction management plan would determine that that was for inspection purposes only. And we would actually ask that that is so because there are concerns about access as and when required. We need to perhaps look at that carefully. But I'm sure, given the assurances we had, that can be looked at. Also, playing times. We'll go back to our first team playing at that level of cricket. They start their games at noon on Saturdays. The working hours shown actually are shown as extending from 0800 to 1300 on Saturdays. Again, we were assured that that could be managed over the length of uh, the works on, as they affect our ground. There are issues, if they're not, about dust, etc., noise and disturbance, which would affect the games. That could affect our status playing at that level of cricket, so we are concerned that these things are managed. So the, the permanent works, as shown, we think they're fine now, that they don't extend over onto our boundary, but the execution of the works we do need to be involved with and we are given assurances that that would be the case in the construction management plan. I think that is it for me. Thank you very much. Do okay. hang on for a moment, yep. leave the microphone on. We, we may well have some questions. <coughs> Councillor the waters. Well, to the officers as well, what reassurance um, could the gentleman be given about um, strict adherence to the working hours in a construction environment management plan, bearing in mind the potential disturbance on a Saturday morning? Um, because my experience of those working hours is they're utterly meaningless and they will just carry on working till whatever time they feel like. Your additional information sheet has a 
section on construction management and specifically around if members consider it necessary that um, there can be a requirement for protective fencing to control dust and, that con and to ensure that construction does not occur in the local area, i.e. around the cricket club, after 12 noon on Saturdays. And I would say that when we were on site on Tuesday, the Environment Agency did give their agreement to 12 o'clock in that specified area. Given the use of the wider area for recreation, is there really any need to be allowing Saturday morning working anywhere? Given the timetable and time scales for works, yes, they would need to go in on a Saturday as well. But you can ask that to the Environment Agency as well. Thank you. Councillor Widdison. It's just a really uh, minor question. How have you liaised at all with Clifton to see if you can share their cricket pitches? With who, sorry? The Clifton Sports Club that you're adjacent to. Is there any, is there any sharing no. of facilities? Well, well, there because is if they've, the... they've got their cricket pitch, that I don't know how available it would be, but I'm sure they'd be open to sharing. No, that's not possible. We'd have, I mean, the standard, besides, we'd have to play on the first team pitch. I don't think York have got sufficient accommodation to allow us to play on their pitch. We're playing the I, same I league. Ge I genuinely no, don't know. But you, I, do I take know it you're talking about York, York Sports Club. Yeah, the yeah. one that you're adjacent to. No, the, the, adjacent we, to we, if you remember, I did say we have, we, have, we have junior teams playing. Okay, they play during the week, but at, at the weekend, we have four senior teams. The first team, no, they, they, it would not be possible to share. I just just this, wondered. That's okay. Because I, I <laughs> we do, do We know. do have to borrow other grounds for some of the some of the teams that we put out but so we, we're already you know no we, we wouldn't be because able to. I do know that they make themselves available to partner with lots and lots of different people so I was just interested to understand if that had been explored it, it, the, the, I mean no it, it wouldn't it wouldn't it would certainly wouldn't work for the first team playing at that standard of cricket because the only ground we'd be able to use would be their second team ground yeah which because isn't good the, the count wasn't the county matches between Warwickshire, Warwickshire and Yorkshire held at yeah, but also that was played on yours, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just, wondering, just wondering if it's... A, so if it's been explored, fine. I just wondered <laughs> if the conversations had happened. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the benefit would be anyway, because are, are you suggesting then that all mayhem could ensue on our ground whilst these works were being constructed? No, I'm not. All I'm saying is if you're worried about the dust and the noise, I know that they're slightly further away. It is further then away, maybe, that's true. Then maybe it would... I'm just looking to see if that... Had, well, if, that seems the, it, because they it, play every other week. Councillor Widdison, thank you. I'll shut I up. Think you've asked the question. Uh, I think we've had an answer to the question. I, I, I think we've got the message. No. <laughs> so thank you very much. Are there any other questions? No. Then thank you. Thank, thank you for you your much. contribution. That's been very helpful. Thank you. And so speaking in support of the application, uh, in support of, uh, on behalf of the applicant, the Environment Agency, uh, Richard Lever. Thank you. Again, three minutes, but I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Richard Lever. I'm the project lead for the Clifton and Rawcliffe um, Flood Elevation Scheme. The proposed flood defence scheme for the Clifton and Rawcliffe area community is one of the projects being delivered by the York Flood Elevation Scheme. Following the severe flooding in York in December 2015, where over 600 properties were flooded, central government committed £45 million to fund properties, to projects to fund properties in the city. The condition attached to the funding is that a scheme must be committed to contract on site by March 2021. The scheme will better protect 134 properties, as well as protecting one of the key transport routes into the city, the A19. In the 2000 flood, 118 properties were flooded in the Royal Cliff area, as well as causing the closure of the A19. If the scheme does not progress, it is highly likely that under the Reservoir Act 1975, the embankment will need to undergo major bank stabilisation works in the near future. These works in themselves would have a similar impact on Triple SI, but without the benefit of the proposed flood risk scheme. The scheme would have the benefit of addressing both bank stability issues better protecting properties and providing greater resilience to climate change. The existing flood embankment was built in the 1980s on land owned by the EA's predecessor. 
In 2013, Clifton and Rawcliffe Meadow, where the majority of the existing flood embankment sits, was designated as a triple SI for the national important floodplain meadow grassland and the population of Tansy beetles. The plan application sets out where there is a public interest in delivering the scheme, but given the location of the existing embankment, there are unavoidable impacts on the triple SI. We have discussed in detail the scheme proposals and the mitigation strategy for the SSSI with Natural England. As the regulator for the SSSI and as a statutory consultee, they have not objected to the scheme, subject to a number of planning conditions. The agreed mitigation strategy with Natural England includes moving areas of designated grass, which will be permanently lost. It also includes the provision of creating further areas of better, more diverse floodplain meadow grassland. In total, up to 2.3 hectares of uh, grassland would be permanently lost. We have committed to provide a total of 12 hectares in mitigation. In developing the SSSI mitigation strategy, we have consulted with leading technical experts in the area, the Floodplain Meadow Partnership. Whilst all parties involved um, acknowledge there are no certainties in the success in moving the turf, there has been agreement this is the best approach for compensating for the loss. In summary, we are confident the applications have been robustly assessed against all requiring uh, environmental issues, required planning policies, and the appropriate mitigation can be delivered. From the engagement we have carried out, the overwhelming majority support the benefits of the scheme. The scheme will better protect 134 properties and the key infrastructure from flooding. And if the scheme did not go ahead, there is a strong likelihood that major construction works would have to take place in the near future to improve the stability of the embankment. Can you very quickly draw to a close? Yeah. Under current government funding rules, there will be no future funding available to make an improvement to the existing embankment other than maintenance of embankment. We therefore want to take this opportunity now to better protect those communities, homes and people in the Clifton and Rawcliffe area. Thank you. Thank you, but please wait for a moment. I would be very surprised if there aren't questions. Uh, I see a number of people indicating. Councillor Douglas, then Councillor Perrett, Councillor Fenton, Councillor Willison, in that order, please. Thank you. Could you put this scheme in the context of flood protection for the whole uh, city so that we understand what the knock-on effects will be elsewhere, please? Um, in total of uh, total kind of projects, an overview of the York Flood Evasion Scheme? Yeah, so this is one project um, of currently 19 projects which are in scope of the Flood Evasion Scheme. So we've got seven flood cells, which uses self-contained flood areas on the FOSS, and the remaining be along the, the ooze. So we have prioritised those using the matrix and bringing those forward through construction plans as we're putting forward on the scheme. OK, I don't, I'm not sure that's perhaps as much detail as uh, I might have liked. I, I, we look in the documents here and it's talking about moving flood risk further down okay. into the city. I was wondering okay, if on you transfer could put flood it risk. Okay, in the sorry. context okay. of that. And I suppose um, uh, perhaps numbers as well, when based on flooding in 2000, 2015, and what the planned programme of works will, uh, so should we get flooding of those levels again, what the plan programme will uh, mean for those properties that were flooded in those events. Okay, so just pick up on the first point about transfer flood risk, which was mentioned earlier, uh, um, brought up. So um, we, uh, we're required to do when we look at any individual flood cell, uh, look at the knock-on impact of transfer flood risk. So this is in essence um, looking at the risk because we're putting a barrier here, that water needs to go somewhere else, so where does it go in? Um, as we build the schemes. So the modelling and looking at the other flood cells, as been mentioned already, shows that there will be a small number of properties, and we estimate that to be four to six properties um, in Marygate area on Frederick Street. Um, the mitigation to those properties is those properties um, fall within uh, another one of our flood cells um, linked to the museum gardens, uh, and that's going through current stages of um, planning and construction, and we anticipate that scheme will actually complete at the same time as we complete on the Clifton Ing scheme. Councillor Perrett. 
Thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask a bit more of a procedural question about consultation, because obviously we've heard from a couple of groups tonight. We've not heard from residents, but just can you sort of reassure us that the consultation with residents really was yeah. happening, and also, yeah, why were other groups who have come tonight not aware of the scheme until relatively recently in the case of the Cricket Club? Yeah, so perhaps pick up the bits, but for, for, first of all, in terms of, of residents. So um, we, we've used newsletters to keep people in the community um, informed. Uh, back in December, um, we mail shot 600 people in the community of Rawcliffe and Clifton, um, publicising that previously through letter drops and so attending ward meetings in the area. So we held an engagement uh, event actually at the Sports Centre at Rawcliffe. Um, I think around 75 people attended that, which is quite a good number for one of these kind of events. Uh, and the overwhelming majority was in support. There were people who have uh, been flooded in the past and understand the issues. There were also people concerned with some of the points that have been raised today and other points about access um, along the way. So we, we've talked to certainly the residents and kept them ongoing informed. Um, we've also um, met a lot of the, um, the clubs and the, the groups down there, so certainly the Allotment Society, um, the Park and Ride, people who manage that. We've talked to the people at the sports club. Um, so there's several sports clubs that I think you appreciate today, so we've met and talked to those about those kind of proposals and the impacts on them during the kind of construction. Thank you. Councillor Fenton, then Councillor Widdowson. Uh, thank you, Chair. So a couple of questions, if I may. First of all, there's been um, reference made to dry side, wet side, and I wonder if you could explain what efforts you've made to ensure as much of the construction as possible is done on the the dry side rather than the wet side. I know we uh, talked through a bit of that on the site visit on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, and the second question is, again, there's been mention made of, um, of, of, sort of suggestions of, sort of a, a lack of resource and lack of effort on the part of the EA in terms of fleshing out some of the mitigation strategies. And I, I know in the conditions, there's a very long list of the strategies that will need to be produced and approved by the authority before any work can be undertaken. The question is, is the EA resourced to actually produce those? Okay, so first question, uh, talking, talking about wet and dry side, I'm happy to pick up the, the issue of the option 24 um, or so. Um, so those people who um, either were on the visit or, or um, know the, the, the area well, um, We'll get the impression quite clearly that it's in a corridor. Um, so it is a corridor that we're talking about, and it's got a number of constraints in terms of um, that particular kind of environment. So particularly along the existing embankment. At its narrowest point, it's around 30 metres wide, the whole of the Rawcliffe um, Meadows section. Um, when we've looked at it, we've looked at a whole series of options and how we can build it and looked at all technical kind of solutions and also different alignments. But when we look at the alignment particular issue, the constraints um, at the top end is the, um, linked to you've got the, the, the basin, which is um, a science of uh, nature conservation. You've then got a low secure NHS hospital, and this is all on the wet side with secure fencing. So at that top end, we're, we're limited physically by what we can do. So there we are, wet side uh, um, raising. As we come a bit further down, we've got more scope. Um, there's a particular bend, and we're doing a combination of dry and wet side raising there. So we are taking the opportunity at that point to do more dry side raising. We then come to a section which is around 300 um, meters long, um, where there's a piece of land on the dry side, um, that, 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 and that particular end of that's actually owned by a house developer. Um, but also there's a water main, um, a Yorkshire water um, sewage main that runs close to the embankment. So we are restricted to how close we can go to that actual water main. And also the economics of actually going through purchasing land and acquiring land and any kind of technical solution, if there was one about the water main, prohibits us in that particular section of three to 400 metres going on the dry side. As we go a bit further down towards the land which has been referred to um, as CYC land, we've been developing the scheme there and we're doing now a combination of dry side and wet side. And on the bend before we get to the cricket pitch, we've now, we're looking at all dry side raising in that particular area. As we turn round and go um, past Clifton Alliance Cricket Club, we are then all wet side raising and that's wet side all the way along um, on the rugby pitches. 
Thank you. And the second point around EA being resourced to produce all of the, the many and varied uh, strategies that are required as conditions. Yeah, we, we have uh, in-house specialisms um, in, on all those environmental kind of areas that we need to produce, and we also have consultants who are part of the project team who have specialisms in those kind of areas as well. So as a project team, I'm confident we've got the right capabilities and resources to deliver those conditions, and obviously we need to deliver those before we can start on construction. Thank you. Councillor Woodison. Um, just a very quick question on, given how long the mitigation or the work to get the, the area back to where it will be, and given the amount of work that the Friends of Warcliffe have put in there, how are the EA placed to make sure that the area is maintained and managed over the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah, so we, so we will hopefully have to go through the next level of kind of thinking how we do that, but we have in-house people. We, we currently have a, a, quite a large number of sites where we have operational structures embankments um, on areas of SSSI land, um, where we maintain those embankments and that land within SSSI, uh, and in open kind of grassland as well. So we have internal workforce. We also have contractor workforce. We, we're very conscious that we can't just outsource this kind of work to a contractor. Uh, it's already been mentioned. It would need to be quite tightly managed and prescribed in terms of the regime of how it be managed. So I, I see it being led by internal people in terms of that operational workforce and how they discharge that would be through a combination of uh, capabilities. Just, just to build on that, how could you partner with people that are already expert in that area? So, absolutely. So we would love to tap into the skills um, of those people, which include Friends of Royal Cliff Meadow. Um, we have talked to them uh, uh, about doing that. We, we've tabled with a member uh, a farm um, tenancy agreement, uh, which is a vehicle to be able to um, use their resource and pay them. And that was in very early discussions. Um, that's not been taken forward at this stage. We would like to take that forward and see how we can use that. Quite clearly, there's huge expertise um, um, it, it, around in those kind of um, groups who could help to make this a success and we would want to do that. It's not our intention to do this um, without consultation, without involvement of other parties. Thank you. Thank you. There are, there are more questions. Uh, Councillor Waters and then Councillor Pavlovic and then Councillor Dagorn. <clears throat> well, bearing in mind one of the major causes of um, properties being flooded in 2015 was the environment agency's, um, how shall I put it, mismanagement of the flood barrier. Um, I didn't particularly appreciate that as an opening gambit that seems designed to uh, put pressure on us to approve this. Uh, I'm particularly interested in a couple of the responses to other questions about um, how you would um, oversee and fund the mitigation strategies. Um, how would that be resourced going forward, 25, 30, 50 years hence? We've already heard that the local authority hasn't really got the resources to monitor it. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in into the funding arrangements for that. Um, so I suppose the first thing to say, we are the environment agency, so you know our whole purpose is to create better places for people and wildlife. Now, quite obviously, there's balance in that, and you're quite clearly seeing a balance being made in you know, our proposal here today. So that's what we're about. So you know, we are committed to supporting the environment. Um, as a government agency, I think we're the most longest standing government agency there's been. So I think it's a reasonable assumption to um, assume that the agency, or it may be renamed, it might report into a different kind of directorate, will be there for the foreseeable future. Um, is this part of our core work that we do? Yes, it is. You know, we manage um, areas, operational assets, as I've already said, in triple SI grassland um, throughout the kind of country. So, cutting to the chase, will there be a sum of money put in escrow to the, to the council um, to ensure that there's correct management of this site going forward 25, 30, 50 years or whatever? Is, is the Environment Agency committing to funding such a programme? So, against the, um, the various plans um, which are detailed in the conditions, we will have to 
um, see, agree those plans, we'll have to firm those plans up, we'll have to cost those plans and we'll put those into our capital scheme to get approval to take these forward. So the funding will be through the environmental agency's approval of the scheme. I won't, I won't pursue it any further, but um, related to finances, we've heard from the friends of Rockcliffe Meadow that as soon as the spade is dug in the cornfield, they lose their funding. They will, in effect, cease to exist on that site. Now, you've said that you would like to work with um, the expertise that's present in that group. Well, do you realise that that expertise will be lost, as I said, the minute a spade is dug into that cornfield? What do you propose to do in terms of maintaining that expertise, funding the Friends of Osbo, uh, Rockcliffe Meadows if needs be? So, uh, we would like to work with um, Friends of Rockcliffe. Um, th there are vehicles to be able to um, pay them, as I've mentioned. We would like those to be taken forward and to work with them in terms of delivering this mitigation. So, we have no, no, you know, no objective, no intention not to work with Friends of Rockcliffe. We would like to work with them. And we think we've got a vehicle to be able to do that through a farm business tenancy agreement. We've looked into that, so we've tabled it at this stage with them. Um, it was for another scheme. Um, we would like to use that as a vehicle so we can work with them. The last question, and officers might, might want to jump in as well, is the issue of all these public rights away and the, the cycle path and everything, and some's going to be closed temporarily, some's going to be altered, some's going to be made permanent. Um, I think from memory in the officer's report it refers to um, use as of right and if, if people were to um, submit an, an application for these to be made permanent rights of way they would certainly succeed. Um, uh, does the prospect of any delay um, due to objections to any of these diversions, temporary closures or anything concern you in any way? Um, there would be a risk to starting on site, so yes, they, you know, they are a risk. Um, to us. Um, our objective all the way through this is, is to maintain um, access at least at the top end and the bottom end of Cl Royal Cliff End. So that was one of the project objectives from the start that we did not want to um, cut off access to Cl Clifton Ings all the way through constrictions because quite clearly you know, many, many people enjoy that um, for a variety of reasons. So we've got a fundamental objective to always maintain access. As um, has been pointed out in the papers, uh, we would also, and I think everybody agrees that we've spoken to, including the Friends of Royal Cliff Meadow, that it would be great if we could get a permanent moving of the Sustrans route and improve that in terms of its width and its location being on the other side of the Ingsdyke. Well, you said that was the last question. Well, I do want to keep things moving on. So may, maybe we'll come back to that, Councillor Waters. I'm not trying to. Uh, stop you asking questions, but I do want to give others the opportunity. Uh, Councillor Pavlovic and then Councillor Degor. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to go back to one of the answers that you gave right at the very beginning relating to the um, risk further downstream, the flood risk further downstream, and you, you, you'll recall I asked the um, officers and, and you've answered that 46 houses are at risk. The work that you've got planned for um, uh, Museum Gardens, which will incorporate that, you haven't got permission for that, have you? That, that's, you're saying that that will be completed at the same time, but no, there's no the, permission in place for so, you to undertake that work. So, the, no, so if you talk specifically about planning permission, no, we've not gained planning permission for the elements we need to for that particular scheme. Uh, in term, there's been internal approvals, for that project to progress. So but if the specific question is about planning permission, no, we haven't got planning permission for the elements we need to at this stage. Um, and then just to go um, back to, uh, again, just for a little bit more detail, uh, I think Councillor Widdison asked the question about the work that's, um, that's going to be required as, as part of the mitigation um, strategy. You heard the officer say, this she didn't feel um, would be suitable for a contractor to take place, um, that it is incredibly specialised. Now, you've mentioned that you have an internal team. What does that team look like? How long are they going to be based there? Is it going to be contractor-led, essentially, or, or contractor-delivered, 
maybe not contractor led um, because this this site is, is, is so nationally significant um, that there are real concerns uh, as to whether the plans for it are going to be maintained in the long term, not over two years, three years, but over 10, 20, 30, 50 yeah. years, because that site is going to be really significant for that period. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the exact skill set needs to come out of some of those further kind of um, documentation we need to um, provide, but, but it will be owned by the EA, uh, and we have a, a team whose full-time job is asset operations of all our infrastructure. So we have specialisms of people how to manage these areas. Um, I do acknowledge that other people would need to be brought up with specific skills and knowledge, but we have consultancy um, um, sources to draw upon, part of our contract kind of framework where we bring in specialist kind of sources. And then there's people, there's a, a gentleman at York University, he's the leading person uh, on the Tansy Beetle. We've spoken to him uh, and talked about some of the methods, particularly around Tansy plants um, already. So, yes, it will be EA owned, there will be EA people involved in that. There will need to be specialist people to be brought to that party to advise, and then a combination of who is best to actually perform the work on the ground. And again, I would hope members of form and other groups will be part of that model. Thank you, Councillor de Gaulle. Yes, a couple of questions. Um, earlier question referred to the, is that option 24 and We've had a, in, in the update here, one of the re most recent representations as the speaker from form questioned why um, some of the calculations and figures seem to have changed from a green entry to a red uh, in terms of a change in view about whether or not that was a viable approach. And there doesn't seem to be a justification in here um, as to why sheet piling um, has not been considered compared to the approach which is obviously going to be more detrimental to the... I don't know if you can explain a little bit about that. Yeah, to, about option 24. So, <clears throat> just to perhaps describe option 24. So, this option um, is based on sheet piling going down through the existing crest height. We would then um, under this option clad it with brick or whatever was acceptable through a planning permission if it got through planning. Um, it would then also require still an extension onto the triple SI um, because part of that is increasing the slope of one and four which is the important part about the bank stabilization work. So um, there would still be an impact on the triple SI um, because of that and also these options didn't take into account the, the whole road um, access and that would still be required under this. So when we, we look at this scoring, so we do the scoring under the EI regs 2017, so it's a part of a structured kind of process which is you know, acknowledged as being the right best practice to use in these kind of situations. So multi-discipline team is used to score it and assess it. Um, and when we look at things like the environment, so yes, there would be a, 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 better, a better outcome than purely full-size work siding, but there's other environmental factors which are taken into account when we, we score that, including things like loss of amenity. So um, if we put a, a wall all the way down that area, that, that wouldn't be, um, what well, it would call into question that footpath access and cycle access all the way there. You'd obviously have a wall probably going down for over a kilometre. Um, so what would that be in terms of impact, in terms of the green belt in particular, uh, in terms of its kind of requirements? Um, sheet piling, that scores down in terms of carbon footprint, uh, in terms of the material that would, would, would be used. Um, health and safety as well, it's got downsides in terms of health and safety, in terms of you've got a wall there, you've obviously got public access, uh, and also another key concern is maintenance. We use that crest of the embankment to maintain it. And obviously there would be a, a visual impact of currently a, a landscape, which you know, um, those people who know the area is a beautiful landscape, you would have a wall all the way down it. So they were all the kind of factors. The, the key factor, um, is the economics uh, of that uh, and um, I do acknowledge that there, there wasn't full um, 
um, statements being made in the matrix. Um, but the fundamental of the economics of this, this scheme of sheet piling uh, and also cladding um, is more expensive than our other schemes. The issue of cost is a key constraint in obviously in any project, but in this particular project is a key constraint to the project. We, um, though we have this funding of 45 million, so we have not the issue of um, a source of money, there is a treasury golden rule that we cannot break, uh, and that's on the benefit cost ratio. The scheme is marginally just above the one. Any cost of this kind of level for these alternative options, and it also applies to the options uh, of the dry side rising on, on the field, would make the scheme unaffordable and we could not deliver it. So cost was the key driver at the end of the day of ruling that um, option just, out. just sort of on that particular point, um, was the triple S, I mean, would you say that the sheet piling had a significantly less impact on the S at triple SI, or is, or is it similar? Or what, what sort of okay, so benefit it, would it, there be? Because the sort of representations we've had said it would be significantly less impact, and therefore the cost benefit needs to take that into account in terms of the impact on triple SI. If you look in the sheet that I think was on the tables, there's a table on the um, the, the loss. So um, the first row of that table embankment shows the permanent, permanent calculation loss of 0.9 hectares. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, in essence, the increased area from the footprint. Um, so we would still need to, um, as I said, increase that footprint. It wouldn't be as great as the proposed option. Um, I haven't got the figures. Right. It okay. could be 50%. I, I don't know. But right. um, it, it would still have an impact on that 0.9. So, you know, it... You know that 4.8 kind of ratio. Okay, and just on you mentioned about the access routes on page top of page 65 in our reports um, was a statement from friends of Rockcliffe Meadows. Nor was any compensation being offered to, for our 15 years of effort uh, for have invested in the cornfield, the results of which will be largely obliterated. Uh, can you sort of quantify? how much impact there will be on the, the cornfield and is that something which is open to further discussion to mitigate that in some way or uh, uh, minimise the impact on that um, so work we need to provide, done? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So we will need to provide further information as part of the, the conditions on, on the, the mitigation. We, we don't have any um, mechanism to pay for previous work, you know, we totally acknowledge, you know, the thousands and thousands of hours that um, form have put into that kind of area. Councillor Kilbane, but I will come back to Councillor Waters after that, if there are outstanding questions. After I was Councilor just going Kilbane. to ask the same question as Councillor Dunham. Okay, so, so it's covered. Very... Thank you. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, what, what, what are the, obviously, during the works, the the loss of the meadows is going to largely a lot of it's going to be in the compression of the soil so so in terms of the mitigation of that um, what methods are you going to use to undo that soil compression so um so the access track um will run all the way down the line um for the congress construction um so we're estimating the worst case of that again back to the table of 1.2 hectares so what we'll do with um, the access, we'll take off the top layers of soil to um, take that soil and, and we'll put that to one side and pile it. Um, and then obviously there's a reinstatement. But that's really valuable because we hope this particular area won't be totally permanently lost. So it's in part of the calculation for permanently lost. So we're hoping that that soil is obviously the right soil because that's where the current MG4 grass is. And through mechanisms of um, seeding and others that will return so we are um, hopeful that that full 1.2 hectares will not be permanently lost it will take a long time so we acknowledge that it'll take a long time but we're hoping that that full point one, that 1.2 will not be permanently lost through that kind of approach well, sorry uh, but, but the whole of the site's going to be compressed isn't it during the works um there'll be working areas so we will fence it off so 
the, the main access route would be the main track. So the guys would be working up and down an access route with turning circles and they'd be working on the embankment. So in terms of the other areas of mitigation, we're talking about this method of translocation, moving the kind of turfs. But, but across the whole of the meadow, wherever you're working, it's going to be compressed, isn't it? While you're building, the, while you're reinforcing the. So where, where the guys are actually working, yes, there'll be compression. So we're going to where the, the, the grass, um, the MG4 grass is, the method that we've put forward and consulted with Floodplain Meadow Partnership is to lift the grass. So we will literally be lifting turfs of grass. So the method that we've discussed with the Meadow Partnership is that we will lift that with circa 300 mil of grass. We will literally move that, so we are talking about a lot of grass. We will literally move that to the area which is at the top end in, in green. Um, that will have to be prepared in terms of that. We've already had the ground tested in terms of its nutrients and that site is suitable to, um, to support the, the growth of the grass coming back. So we'll lift and put that grass so that won't be impacted if you like during construction because it will already be removed. And the other areas of the table will, will do the technique of lifting the soil, piling it and putting it back at the end. But, sorry, I'm, I'm probably just being a bit thick here, but in, in terms of where you're actually building the bank, you know, I know where the mitigation area is, yeah. but in terms of where you're actually building the bank, the soil's going to be compressed there where the meadow is now. Yeah, after we've taken the turf out, after we've taken the turf off, yeah. Okay, and so how are you going to... Not, not in the mitigation areas, not raw cliff uh, in sense, but in front of the bank, how are you going to uh, return the meadow to its current state? How are you going to decompress the soil? So, so de I suppose I'm reiterating the point, so I don't know if I'm answering your question. Then. So we are taking a, a large part of the top soil off, because that obviously would be compressed and is yeah. viable, and yeah, yeah. storing that, and then we're going to put that back. Put that back. I am not an expert in um, how... Um, it will be at a, a detail level how that will be really become. Okay. okay, I'm sorry, there's just a few more questions. Be quick. Well, I think it's quite an important That's fine, subject, but carry on. Uh, with your uh, permission. Um, do you think it's, uh, that the mitigation methods that you're talking about now uh, are included in the cost of the project? Is also the sort of the ongoing mitigation and monitoring of that over the next 30 years, is that also included in the cost of the project? So as part of our approval process, we'll have to show the total lifetime cost. So we've already heard about how you can't um, do sheet piling because it would bust the bank and you can't afford it. What if the mitigation and monitoring measures that you need to do in order to return this area to the wonderful state that it's in now are unaffordable? Um, it, it, so I suppose two things. We, we've made quite conservative estimates of those costs at the moment, so they are in the budget at the moment. Ultimately, if we can't afford them, the scheme will not go ahead. So you've got a budget for the next 30 years of mitigation and monitoring? We'll have to put those within the total lifetime cost of the, of the budget approval. Okay. And you've got a rough idea of what those figures are? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it, did I um, understand you rightly uh, when you were giving your presentation, and I might be paraphrasing here, um, but you seem to say to us that if we don't give you planning approval uh, for this defence tonight, you're going to do it anyway under the Reservoirs Act. Is that right? So the next speaker will read a statement on behalf of the Reservoir um, Engineer, Supervising Engineer, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. He's out of the country on business. Um, so if... Um, the stabilisation, if our work does not go ahead, it is highly likely that future stabilisation work will be required along this stretch of the embankment. That will require similar type of construction on all the wet side. Uh, we did remedial action in 2012, I think it was, 2013 I think it was, um, and the, you know that was quite extensive kind of engineering. It was bulldozers in there, so we would have to carry out that scale of work. So yes. So it is highly likely that we will have to go onto site and carry out extensive remedial work. And just how would you describe your uh, working relationship with the friends of Rawcliffe Meadows? 
Um, I think it's fair to say that um, our objectives during this phase uh, are not aligned. Um, we've had some very effective meetings. We had a, a mitigation workshop where um, Friends of Royal Cliff were there, along with the flood run, uh, and that was really good and cooperative. Uh, and you know, they have got lots of experience and lots of knowledge, and that went into that mitigation strategy and thinking. Um, some of the members are um, informing us and helping us in terms of the practical um, work of gathering seeds and things like that. So um, uh, there's been lots of cooperation. Um, I think quite clearly we're um, at this stage where we've got different objectives. You know, we have an embankment. It's you know, it is unfortunate. We have got a flood defence asset that we cannot move on a narrow strip of land which sits on a triple SI which is very valuable. That's you know, reality, and what we're trying to do is find a solution um, to how we can best move forward with mitigation to do that. I hope, uh, and my commitment is to seek to work with friends of Rawcliff Meadow going forward, uh, and I hope when we, you know, hopefully um, we move this project forward, we will find ways that we can work together. Thank you, and finally, Chair, if I may, um, how, Oh, your, how is the EA's compliance with the, with the conditions that are in the, in, uh, attached to the application? How, how are they going to be monitored? Um, so they've been reported uh, in conditions, so I don't know how conditions will be reported back to CYC, so I presume there's obviously, uh, I would expect, a check on all those conditions being delivered as part of any kind of platform allocation. On so now, how are you going to monitor that you're going to comply with those conditions during the project? and in for the next 30 years. So how we can report those? So as any organisation, as you probably would expect, we have internal metrics and monitoring. So there's a, a governance system within the project structure at the moment about reporting on delivery. So, you know, key kind of um, deliverables are reported through that and escalated through that. Obviously that project governance board will stop at the end of the projects, but then there's operational reporting and stats that go all the way through the organisation. So, you know, the EA, is very good at process and reporting. So we have those kind of mechanisms in place. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody else indicating they have any further questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But we do have another uh, speaker in support, as you have already referred to, Warwick Dale of Jacobs, who will be reading a statement from the Reservoir Supervising Engineer. Thank you. Ian Edmonds is the supervising engineer under the uh, Reservoirs Act. Unfortunately, he can't be here. He's out of the country. He uh, recognises this is an important matter and sends his apologies. So this is his statement. I've been the supervising engineer for Clifton Ings Reservoir since 2015. And whilst the embankments have been stable during this time, there has been a formal agreement with Natural England which allows for reduced drawdown rates following the reservoir being called into operation. It is impossible to say what would happen to the barrier bank if this reduced drawdown was not in place, but it is highly likely, based on historic performance, that the upstream face of the dam would fail during drawdown due to high pore water pressure and a slope that is over steep for the material from which it is constructed. The proposed construction both addresses the current over steep upstream face and raises the embankment, extending it to the north and south, such that it offers a high standard of flood protection to the area back behind the defence. Once these works are complete, the reservoir can be operated as intended, with no restriction on drawdown ensuring it is available should a double peak event occur. This availability is key if it is to operate as intended with the other flood alleviation assets around York. If the EA is unable to proceed with the remedial works to the upstream phase and unable to extend the arrangement with Natural England to maintain a reduced drawdown rate following flood events, I will need to call for a Section 10 inspection 
which is likely to impose a measure in the interest of safety under the Reservoirs Act 1975 on the EA to undertake remedial works to stabilise the upstream face within a given time frame. Equally, if the EA are unable to proceed and after the storage area is brought into use, another slip develops on the inward face of the barrier bank, even with the reduced drawdown, I would also need to call for a Section 10 inspection. Again, this is likely to impose a measure in the interest of safety on the EA to remediate the barrier bank. A measure in the interest of safety raised during a Section 10 inspection is legally enforceable. It is also worth remembering that if the storage area is brought into use and the barrier bank failed, we could see uncontrolled release of water to the Shipton Road area. This uncontrolled release of water could threaten lives, which is why this reservoir is classified as Category A, that's general standard, in Table 1 of Floods and Reservoirs Safety, 3rd edition, published by the Institution of Civil Engineers. Any questions? Councillor Waters. If you had to carry out maintenance under those acts, um, would you be considering sheet piling as a suitable um, method to use? Um, it's not for the supervising engineer to dictate the method by which the construction is undertaken, only that the, the the improvements are made. Fair enough, it's not specifying it, but um, would it be a viable uh, method? It would be an option, yes. Thank you. No further questions, oh, Councillor Dagorn. Just one, um, just so we're aware, you, you're talking about um, quite a long section of, of bank here. Is, is this vulnerability that, that's been identified the whole length of the bank or a particular location? Do you know, are you aware of, of that or not? Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. I see no further questions. Thank you very much. Well, we've been going for quite a while now. Uh, some of us may be needing a comfort break, so we're going to take a break, but very briefly, just a couple of minutes, and we'll resume. Thank you.
you very much. I think we're all back in the room. And hopefully uh, a little more comfortable. So we move into debate. We have, of course, the officer's recommendation of approval, but we've heard a lot of very technical information um, at some points. Um, uh, well, I, 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 I open it for your contributions. Where do we go? Yeah. Councillor Kilbane. Can I just ask a point of clarification? So if we approve the, the works tonight, uh, will the area lose its triple SI status? Yes. Yes, I think is a simple answer. Yeah. Oh, well, only if the works are carried out, we can give it permission, but they actually have to be carried out. Yeah. Councillor Fenton. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it, it's been very helpful to, in some ways, continue the discussion this evening that we, we started on the uh, very enjoyable site visit on Tuesday. It was a very um, pleasant stroll, and, and certainly I learned a lot about a site, um, which, having lived in York for um, over 15 years, I'm ashamed to say I'd never visited, um, but I was pleased to have the opportunity to do so. Um, I think the, the key issue in, in my mind is the condition of the bank, and we've heard um, uh, a, a quite um, a kind of stark statement, which is, is what we, 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 we finished that session with in terms of, um, in terms of the potential implications of, uh, of a failure of that bank. So I think there's probably some consensus around the, the necessity of works to be carried out to at least make um, that bank's, uh, well, s safe and, and effective so it can do the job it's there to do. Um, I think the issue we're probably all grappling with is, is, is the clear disbenefits to the work that is proposed in terms of the triple SI, and that's really um, can't, can't be dismissed because it's very apparent and having visited the site, it brings it home what a unique site it is. Obviously, we have lots of conditions um, uh, at the end of this, uh, this paper, which will all need to have been, um, will all need to have been met in order for, for, for any approval to be given, to be given force and for any work to be done on the site. Um, as, as some of the speakers have alluded to, I don't think any of us really know um, how successful some of those mitigation measures will be. Um, there are, uh, yeah, obviously, it's very hard to predict nature. We can uh, seek expert advice and try and plan and mitigate as best we can. Um, but I think what weighs on my mind is, in particular, is, um, is is not knowing that I'm making a decision on the basis of the information that we have, but then that's all we can do. Um, so on the basis of the non-issues with the bank itself um, and the information that we do have in terms of mitigation strategies, um, I think on balance I would support the officer recommendation to approve. Councillor Waters. I certainly wouldn't want my name um, to this in its present format. I fully agree that the works need to be carried out, but they also need to be carried out to minimise the environmental destruction. And I don't feel that there's been a full appraisal of the various options, because as we've heard, the key factor is cost. If carrying these works out uh, with other methods, and I keep returning to sheet piling, is going to cost more from a financial point of view of the engineering works, but maintain the integrity of the Rockcliffe Meadows at the end of it, then personally I think we should be deferring a decision as this planning committee, throwing it back to the Environment Agency, and if they need more money, it needs to be chucked back to government. As we've heard, Rockcliffe Meadows are a nationally important wildlife area, and if we approve this, as you've heard, 
the, the people with the experience of 30 years of creating or renovating it to its current standard are virtually going to walk away from it and we will be responsible and there's all this talk of mitigation there's two examples of mitigation that were carried out as a result of the Derwentthorpe development both of which have been a disaster mitigation is a last mitigation translocation and all the rest is the last resort on these type of things we should be looking or insisting on a far better less disruptive scheme and my view would be deferring it for a month or possibly two while other options are explored and I would hope the Environment Agency would take on board the comments and thoughts of the Planning Committee were such a decision reached and that's the meadows, the trees and the hedgerows. We need to be minimising that type of disruption. Thank you Councillor Waters. Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you Chair. Um, I'm not sure what advantage there will be uh, in respect of deferring. But there are a number of features um, regarding this application that I have significant concerns about. Um, I think the officers have done um, their best to balance um, what must have been a very difficult decision for them. Um, and I'd like to commend them for the effort that they've put into it. But it was barely three months ago, probably less, that um, we all sat around this table um, decrying the loss of a triple SI site um, elsewhere in the city and yet we're just prepared to say um, well it's a different one it's a different it's a different agency applying um, so we're prepared to abandon a, nat a nationally important site secondly um, I think any scheme that's predicated on causing an increased flood risk somewhere else in the city um, and e effectively saying that the houses um, in Marygate are less important and we have to accept that there has been no permission given for any work at museum gardens um, that some residents are more important than others. So I will be, um, I will be proposing, Chair, uh, a refusal of this application. Um, and I think saying that cost is the determinant as to whether um, a, cheaper, a, 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 a more effective scheme for the wildlife and biodiversity of that site is I just think a really sad indictment uh, and I do take Councillor Waters point that if they haven't got enough money to undertake a scheme that will protect the environment they should be asking for more so um, I won't be supporting a deferment but I will be proposing uh, a refusal Thank you Councillor Powell, that Councillor De Gaulle uh, I think it's quite quite clear that this is a very difficult decision um, but I'm sufficiently convinced that there are still a lot of questions that haven't been answered in terms of minimising the impact um, on the environment particularly as you know I mean it, it must be particularly galling for people who spent 20 30 years uh, with very little support from the City of York Council or the Environment Agency, uh, getting this to the point, this area to the point where it does qualify for a triple SI um, you know, as being of national significance. And, and then there are, there are certainly, um, McFibbin referred to um, nat uh, Natural England having made certain requirements that have not been answered in the, the response. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm sort of torn between complete refusal and deferral. I, I'm quite happy to support either proposal. Um, but I think having 
experience of working with the Environment Agency, obviously we've got a very difficult ta task, but I know from elsewhere in the city that where things have been delayed, they have been prepared to look at things again and, and work through the difficulties with the residents and with community groups to, to come up with a better solution. And I think um, the point that Councillor Pavlovic made about, I was rather shocked to read in this report that the, the work here is going to actually increase the risk downstream. Admittedly, you know, I can understand there may be limits to, as to what can be achieved with the infrastructure there and, and inevitably if you stop flooding in one place that's going to increase the risk of flooding further downstream but we shouldn't be endorsing something particularly as has been pointed out where it depends on another scheme which is going to be controversial and needs careful consideration as to how that can be achieved as well so I, I'm not happy to not prepared to support this at this moment in time. Thank you. Councillor Woodison and then Councillor Fitzpatrick. Can I just clarify a point on um, moving the flood risk down? If you construct anything upstream, you do move the flood risk down. And the whole, my understanding from the work that the EA have done is that they have done this on a city-wide basis, but we're asking for information on it bit by bit, which is why it's coming across as it's moving it downstream. If you take the holistic approach of all of the different flood cells, and they've given, I think it was webcast, they've given me a report on that, and it shows you how it protects the entire city. The intention, I'm assuming, is for us to pass the planning in Marygate, or pass the planning down at New Walk, or pass the planning down at Skeldergate, so that the whole of the city is protected against the disturbance that everybody put up with in 2015 and 2000. That's my understanding, is that it's to give protection to the city, to the hundreds of houses that were flooded, and to the hundreds of businesses that were disturbed, and to the lack of income that the city got because of the press that we got. So I hear what you're saying about it's moving it down, but that's because we've taken it as an individual item rather than looking at it holistically. Am I allowed to ask anybody else to join in, Chair? I'm not sure of procedures and processes. Uh, when I you just say ask make somebody sure else to join in, what, I'm people, just please making clarify. sure that I'm making... Is what I'm saying, Steve, factually correct? Yeah, just, yeah. Come to the microphone. Uh, yes, Councillor Woodson, it's, uh, and that's what I said. I said each of the individual schemes looks at that transference of risk downstream and puts the uplifts into the height of the defences. So they put a climate change uplift in, we'd also look at that squeeze and that uplift downstream and, and they will be designed with that in mind. But obviously, as you correctly say, they need to come to us as individual schemes. So today we're looking at just this scheme. Right, okay. So I just wanted that clarification in there because it's not transferring the risk, it's actually doing the whole city, but they have the mechanics that they have to work by is such that it comes out looking like that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Fitzpatrick. Whilst I fully support um, everything that's been said over there, nobody wants to see damage to an area, to the meadows, to all of that. Um, I'm finding this difficult, but I do have to. I understand what you're saying, Councillor Widowson, but I represent the Marygate area. Um, and I have to think about the impact there. And yes, I understand the holistic view, but we are taking this bit by bit, really. And we, um, we are, as councillors, are due to be uh, meeting, to be discussing the next phase down soon, but not yet. Um, I just have to bear that in mind. I haven't yet decided whether I'm going to um, go along with refusal or deferment, but, um, you know, I, I, as I say, that's my position. Councillor Kilbane, and come back to Councillor Willison. So I'm never, um, never like making a decision with a gun held to me head. Um, either, you know, approve this or we'll do it anyway, or um, you need to see this in the aspect of other planning applications. We're here to look at the one application that is in front of us. Um, and the greatest concern that's been raised in this application is the environment. Um, Obviously, 
we have a duty to try and protect the properties and the homes of people uh, living in York. It is um, noticeable that nobody uh, from the properties to be protected has come and spoken in favour of, um, uh, of the scheme tonight, um, which is interesting. Um, to me, the, the difficulty with this and, and at the core of it is the relationship between the Environment Agency uh, and the Friends of, uh, uh, of Rawcliffe Meadows, which seems to be at a point um, of breakdown, and that causes me uh, quite a long, lot of concern. As it stands, I'm minded to uh, defer or reject, because I think the Environment Agency needs to um, mend that relationship uh, with the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadows and, um, and take on board more of what they're saying. And also, I'm not confident that over such a long period of time in terms of the mitigation, I'm not confident that it will be delivered, uh, and I'm not confident that it will be independently uh, monitored. Uh, we've already heard how there's very little resources in the, um, within, the, within the council for, for, for doing that, and it's left to the Environment Agency, then really they're just marking their own homework, aren't they? Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to see there being some joint supervisory body to make sure that the works that are carried out do as little damage to the uh, environment uh, and to the SSI and to the whole site, in fact, uh, as possible. Uh, and I think um, I wouldn't be minded to approve this application until uh, such a system of monitoring and supervision and uh, ensuring that the minimisation of environmental damage is, is in place. I mean, the whole irony of this situation is that one of the reasons that we're having to restore our flood defences and improve them is, is because of climate change and the thing that we're trashing in this scheme is the thing that will help us out of that situation. Thank you for your succinct comments. Um, I have a number of indicated. I did say, Councillor Willison, I'm aware that Councillor Holly wants to say something. You're passing for the moment. Okay. And then uh, Councillor uh, has. Sorry. Um, it was just a question, really, in relation to the, the Reservoirs Act part that we just heard at, at the end. Is there any information on what exactly the um, implications or the effect on the, S the SSSI would be if that was undertaken? Because I suppose, is it a completely different area that would be affected? Is it more or less the same area? Would, would the effects of it be similar to what is being proposed here? Or does that have no relation on the application we're considering because it's a different, different issue? Because if, if it's the case that actually if, if we didn't give approval and they did some works under the Reservoirs Act that they led to the same um, sort of damage to the triple SI. Simple answer is we can't, we can't answer that because we don't know what works are required under the Reservoir Act at this moment in time. So would, would we, it we, we do know that potentially in the future there will need to be works done mm -hmm. there that could be done under the Reservoir Act, but we don't know at this moment in time what they are because they ha that hasn't been explored this is my understanding yep okay. in, but, it, would but, a deferral then for a month give an opportunity for that to be quantified so that we could consider the application against what might otherwise happen sorry if i could um, if, uh, chair if, if i might uh, perhaps contrary just a uh, number of members of the committee have talked about potential of deferring um, the, uh, the, the application perfectly entitled to do so if you're minded to do that I would ask you to do so on particular grounds on specific grounds the type of thing that Councillor Hollier has just mentioned would be an example of that um, if you wanted additional information regarding the default position works carried out uh, uh, pursuant to the powers available to the agency under the Reservoirs Act then to the extent that they're able to provide that information you're able to require it of them. I think it was the second speaker on behalf of the agency, that Mr. Um, uh, Dale from Jacobs, he was actually reading a statement on behalf of somebody who wasn't here, who may have been better placed to answer some of those questions. So I say that with all due respect to Mr. Dale. So uh, thank you, sir. 
I know, I know, I just, can I just, sorry, just one minute. I know that you came in and you said in a month. I don't think that it, realistically that level of information we could get back to you within a month. Yeah, right. Because it may be as well, because it depends on the level of information that members request, because this, this application has come with an environmental statement. And depending on the level of information that is then resubmitted, that might need to be re-advertised. It, it's not necessary. I can't promise you a quick turnaround because I don't know the level of information that potentially we'll receive back. That's just a just put that out there. Um, just a question for the office. Just hang on for a moment. Well, uh, I did promise. Okay. Just a question for the two officers while we were talking deferment and such like. Um, it worries me that an outright refusal of this would send out the wrong signals in that we should be working with the Environment Agency. I'd just like to know, um, in terms of um, timescales, what the difference would be for the project if it was refused as against deferred for a month or two months, preferably. That's a difficult one in the simple I can't give you an answer because I'm not the Environment Agency. I don't know what you're going to defer it on and I don't know what... If you refused it, it would mean a whole new planning application. Yeah. You've got to go out to the advertisement, we've got to do all that. But it also depends on what you defer it on. Because potentially if you're requesting a significant amount of additional information, we may have to do that anyway. So I, it, I can't really give you an answer to that in terms of what will take the longest amount of time. But it all depends on what you're going to ask for and where you're going to... Does that, I know I've not really answered your question, but I don't think that I can in terms well, of... If I could help you, in all probability, a refusal would delay the whole process a lot longer than a deferral. Is that a fair comment? That would be a fair comment, depending on what you defer it for. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Councillor Barker, if... OK, thank you. Councillor thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Jay. That was actually quite handy for, to have those comments from Glenn, because that was one of the points that I was in many ways going to make. I'm not somebody who's ever been much of a fan of deferring planning applications. I think we should make a decision, and certainly on the grounds that Councillor Waters originally suggested in terms of a cost issue, I think, of all the councillors around here for Councillor Waters to suggest we should go back to the government for solution was probably one of the most surprising things I've possibly heard, and that suggestion that it's somehow the government would make a funding decision in the next couple of months, I think is absolutely pie in the sky in terms of that. So to suggest that we go back and ask them for more money in the next two months is, ju is just not a reason to defer the application. Uh, Councillor Gorn had better arguments in terms of more information around some of the options, and that was, was starting to make me interesting. The points that Councillor Hollier made are, again, give us potentially something, but I'm struggling to see in many ways what could change massively in the next couple of months if we were to defer it and I fear we may end up back in exactly the same situation we're in now with very with a little bit more information than we've got now but exactly the same problems and exactly the same debates. Uh, Councillor Kilban, I'm quite new to the planning committee one thing I will say for being on the planning committee for far longer than I perhaps should is nobody ever turns up to speak in favour of any planning application it's very rare to have that we will have a long list of people who oppose planning applications but of all the ones, I think maybe seven people in 20 years have turned up to actually speak in favour of it. Uh, I think the cost issue, again, is something of a misnomer. If the information we were given is true, it's not a case of doing whichever scheme is cheapest. The information we had was it's doing whichever scheme will receive funding, and that is very different. If the increase in cost leads to an overall loss of funding, then it's a choice between doing the scheme or not doing the scheme, not about doing which is the, the cheapest option. And then my final concern is around that Reservoir Act issue, which is where I started to be swayed a little bit with Councillor Hollier, because while we may not always like the particular schemes we have, doing things in a planned way and through a planning committee does allow us to exert a little bit of control. There are a raft of conditions that we can put on this application that will allow us to, to have a, more of a control <laughs> over the scheme that happens. My concern is if they go down the Reservoir Act, they will not require planning permission and they will pretty much be able to do precisely what they want to do. And a lot of the things we've tried to secure as part of this sort of condition agreement would be lost under that process. So I still don't know what I've decided and perhaps having a little bit more clarity about the fact that if it's true that they could use the Reservoir Act to just go ahead and do precisely the scheme that they want to do without any of the sort of controls and levers of the planning process, and I probably would lean towards not deferring and voting in favour, but I shall 
listen to the rest of the debate. Councillor Pavlovic has a question. Councillor Barker indicated he wanted to say something. Just, just on, just Councillor on Pavlovic, that, I'll, come to, I'll come to you. Just on that, Chair, that, that wasn't my understanding that the Reservoir Act gave the EA the carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. They still, uh, well, can I ask officers what the Reservoirs Act powers gives the um, EA? I understood they had to clarify what they were doing and make sure that it didn't have an impact, but I, I stand to be corrected. Um, I think in addition to the statement that, that uh, the environment agency read out from, from the inspector, uh, the Reservoirs Act means that any large range reservoir over a certain standard, of which Clifton Ings is, is one, is inspected annually by an independent specialist inspector. Those inspectors look at the construction of the reservoir assets and, as the statement said, there can be measures in the interest of safety put forward where there are condition concerns and issues. Um, we're not at that stage with Cliftonings at the minute. We have been there after the 2015 floods. Um, it's, it's, typically, it's just disappeared. Uh, the biggest 90 degree bend partway along the reach on the back of the barrier bank. There was a slump there, and the agency came in and did some works there. Um, what could, could happen over the next few years? It is impossible to say, as various members have said. We could inspect, you know, the agency could inspect it next year, and there might be two potential breaches. There might be none. There might be another three in year three, it might be none again. But if the inspector comes in and says those works are necessary, as, as the statement said, the Environment Agency, like any reservoir undertaker, would be compelled to go in and do the works. Now, that doesn't mean that they can go in and just do it however they see fit. They would still have to liaise very carefully with Natural England um, to make sure that there is minimal impact to the SSSI. But something that I don't think came across, and I think, I think it's important, important to raise, the important thing to raise is that would only be to carry out capital maintenance works to the existing standard of protection that that bank affords. It would not be to a new standard of protection looking forward with climate change in mind. And those 140 odd properties that would benefit from that scheme wouldn't benefit because it would be capital maintenance at the current standard of protection. The cumulative impact on the SSSI could be through multiple schemes all coming in and you know that maybe there might be less impact, there might be more, it's, it's impossible to say. But it, it all depends on what the inspector says going forward but they would need to go in. But I think the important thing from me and from a flood risk point of view is it would be at the current standard of protection, it wouldn't be putting in place that new level of protection. Can just, I just for clarity on that point, they would have to consult Natural England and Natural England didn't object to any of the proposed damage to the SSSI as part of this scheme. That's my understanding, yeah. and I might be slightly awry. And, and but they wouldn't have to go and talk to just friends of view, but Marcus yes. Meadows or, yeah. or any of the, yeah. the external bodies. Actually, it would just be Natural England who seem happy with the destruction in the first place. This may not be terribly relevant, but I'll ask it anyway. If work is done under the Reservoir Act, is there a separate budget for that work? Um, the agency does have reservoirs budgets. Now, whether or not that would be applicable here, I just don't know. Thank you, Chair. For me, it's really what is the lesser of the two evils. Um, and we've heard about public safety, and I think that has to be the overriding precedent. And I just wonder, if those households that get flooded and find themselves knee deep in foul water will have the same sympathies with the triple SI that we're hearing some of the members speak about tonight. And to my mind, doing nothing is not an option, and therefore I'm minded to approve this. Thank you. Any other comments, Councillor Doughty? Thank you, Chair. I'm really conflicted with this one. Um, I can understand and sympathise with the comments of I think everyone around this table that's spoken so far. Um, one thing that's sticking in my mind is um, the comment from the last speaker about the potential for an uncontrollable release of water on Shipton Road. And that, for me, you know, is something 
can I have an ease of conscience if we refuse this application? And that's the point I was making. Um, so if, if there was some way that we could get some benefits from mitigation by deferring um, some tangible benefits within the next couple of months, then that might be something that I could be swayed for. But I won't be voting against the application. Thank you. Councillor Fenton, then Councillor de Gorn. I think <clears throat> just to sort of mulling over what um, a deferral might mean in terms of, uh, I, I, get the, I get the sense that members would be wanting to, to know a bit more about what a, uh, a requirement to undertake works under the Reservoir Act would mean. I, I'm not sure what, other than having a technical explanation as to the legal basis on which that work could be done, and I take the point that would simply be a, um, a repair to the barrier at the current height. It wouldn't afford any um, additional protection. That wouldn't tell us any more about mitigation because there, there isn't a, a separate mitigation plan in the event of work being undertaken to be triggered by the Reservoir Act. I, I don't know whether the, uh, the impact on the SSSI would be any, any greater or, or, or any lesser. I would imagine it would be marginally less impactful because if it, if it wasn't the um, increasing the height of the barrier but mainly um, you know, securing areas of it that were, that were weak and I would, I would struggle to, to defer or to refuse on the basis of coming back in however many months um, to, to look at, to have a technical explanation as to why, as to how the Reservoir Act a repair under the Reservoir Act would be, uh, would be enacted, but having no more detailed information about mitigation, what, again, what I come back to is, um, is having that assurance, uh, when I, which I hope it is, that un unless and until we as an authority are, are, are satisfied with the level of detail and, and, and realistic conditions um, without which you know, there shouldn't be a, a shovel gone in the ground, we, uh, I, I have to put my faith in that in terms of as the basis for, for my support for the application as it stands um, and, and I just I, I kind of can't see beyond that at the moment Yes um, in terms of, I'm, I'm sort of having heard the debate I'm veering more towards deferral partly on the basis that um, some of the detail here is not spelt out well. I mean, if you look at the, the uh, suggested condition for Tansy Beetle Mitigation Strategy, no development until it had been submitted and approved. There's no detail about, as, as one of the speakers pointed out, there's no detail about, about what that might be, who's going to operate, who's going to monitor it, who's going to, how it's going to be managed in the going forward. I'm also very concerned, as other councillors have said, that uh, we have reached the point where the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadow quite clearly have indicated that if we approve this, they will be, they see this as a precedent, not just for York, but also an um, impact on precedent for triple SIs elsewhere in the country. And therefore, potentially we get into um, the territory of uh, public inquiry, which if we could actually defer this and ask for more specific detail about the management plan, how a 10 or 20 year management plan might be worked up in, with cooperation from those people who've cared for this land for the last 20 or 30 years and the Environment Agency, who have obviously got an important job to do, I think we need to put some some strength of leverage behind making that cooperation happen. If there's going to be a 10 or 20 year time scale for my managing this going forward, there's no way that the £67,000 you know, should be withdrawn without any sort of longer term strategy of where that money is going to come from, how the Environment Agency and the Friends are going to work together in going forward. So I would like to see this deferred. Uh, for that, those sort of discussions to go to take place, 
very clearly about working up a, a whether it's a management committee or the friends or how that's going to happen um, but also to look at mitigation strategy and the implications this has for triple SIs around the country um, where flood you know isn't this can't be the only place in the country where a triple SI is vulnerable to flood defense works and have we got the right approach here compared to what how that's been approached elsewhere in the country with environment agency so I want to see some of that also going into a report that comes back to us thank you councillor Dion I've got a number of, who've indicated uh, first councillor Waters then councillor Pavlovic then councillor Widdowson and just so it doesn't get forgotten, Douglas. deferral offers the opportunity to look again at the reappraisal of the options and specifically the one around sheet piling. Uh, I'm sure if we asked the council's ecologist, she would concur that such an option will be the least environmentally damaging of the various options that they could work to. Councillor Pavlovic. Thanks, Chair. I thought as we were having second goes, I'd get... Um, I, I, well, not just I'd for the sake of it. No, no, it's not. No, I, I, but I wanted to respond to um, some of the points made earlier on in the debate. Both Councillor Widdowson and Councillor Fenton have said this, this application has to be dealt with on what it is today. I don't know what the planning application relating to uh, museum gardens is going to look like. It might involve desecration of a, uh, of a Grade 1 site. Um, all I can do is, is see this application which says granting this application will cause a permanent increase in flooding um, in Frederick Street and in Marygate. And on those terms and those terms alone, I'm refusing it. Thank you. Councillor Widdowson. I'll just repeat what I said earlier regarding right. that. You, I understand what you're saying, we have to do it on this particular application. Okay. But if you look at the whole scheme, that isn't what's Thank intended you. and that isn't what's going to happen. That isn't what I was going to say, though. Okay. Right. What I wanted to say was my understanding is we have got enough information at the moment to make a decision one way or the other. I think if we defer, we're going to get into technicalities about can the um, reservoir, I keep thinking reservoir dogs in my head, <laughs> can the reservoir act trample over everything and make it worse than what's currently here, which is in our heads. So we're actually between the devil and the deep blue sea. It's a really difficult decision. We've got 112 or 120, I cannot remember the number off the top of my head, of houses that this will protect because it will go higher than any of the um, work that has to happen if the reservoir does fail, which will not do the protection. If the reservoir fails, what will people who are trying to get across Shipton Road say? Do we end up in a Whaley Bridge situation, which has got to be in people's heads as well? I think, I understand what you're saying about taking it just on its merits, but I actually think it's a red herring, saying that it increases the flood risk further downstream because we've got a whole we've got a whole scheme for the entire city and it's how it has to be put into certain papers so i am extraordinarily conflicted in this i think the mitigation is good but could be better i want to see a significant improvement in the relationship between the friends of rawcliffe who've got 30 years experience in the ea and I know both parties have got a lot of skin in the game, and I know both parties can be minded to work together, which is what we all want to happen. And, and in the situation between it could fail, and we're in this position, it could not be approved, and we lose all the funding for all of the houses across the entirety of York, between the devil and the deep blue sea, I'm gonna choose the deep blue sea, and I will approve. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say I'm broadly in agreement with Councillor de Gorn and um, I think that we do need to defer. I think the things that you brought up about what we need further information on are really valid and um, for 
friends of uh, Rawcliffe Meadows, we're talking about six to seven thousand, not sixty-seven thousand. So it's not huge amounts of money. And I think that funding vehicles to work with um, that they are out there, and that the Environment Agency needs to come back to us with a route for making sure that they're still involved on the site is important as well. Um, but then I do agree with what you said about the system wide and also the potential implications and also that um, there's going to be impact to this area no matter what route we take and what work has to be done at some point in the future. And I would prefer that we have planning control over that um, in the limited way that we can. Um, it's still not ideal, but I think it's possibly the best option we have and uh, so I would like to call for deferral but with conditions attached to that that um, answer the questions that are still outstanding at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kilbane, I, think, I think we need to find some way of moving on. We've, we're in danger of rehearsing the same arguments and I want to avoid that. Well, Chair, I think I might have a way out of this for us then. Um, what I would suggest is that we defer the decision until um, such a time as the Environment Agency has drawn up its plans as to how it's going to comply uh, with conditions 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, 8, uh, 9, um, all of which say that nothing will happen until full detailed plans have been drawn up of how we're going to do this mitigation. Um, so what I suggest is we defer until those plans are drawn up, um, that those plans are drawn up in consultation with all the key stakeholders, uh, so that be Natural England, Friends of uh, Rawcliffe Meadows, etc. And that uh, when this comes back to planning, we want to see a system in place that will manage and supervise and monitor uh, the site, if both during the works, the whole site, both during the works and for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, to make sure that uh, whatever mitigation is being put in place is actually put in place and to monitor uh, how that's working. So I would propose deferments on those grounds. Thank you, Councillor Kilbane. I'm looking for a seconder. Councillor De Gorn has seconded that. Can I just check that if we were to, if this were to be, be approved by the committee, do you feel that we have in what has been suggested, adequate. I, th I think, well, Chair, if, if, the, if, the, if the committee feels that there is inadequate information before it in order to determine the application, then it's perfectly proper for the committee to defer it on that basis. In terms of the information sought, however, the local planning authority does have an obligation to the applicant to be reasonable and to discharge the full suite of conditions which have been drafted in their entirety as a preliminary to the determination of the application. I, I think, in my opinion, perhaps goes be beyond that. I think if there are particular um, aspects of the conditions as drafted or as the application that is before you, which requires additional information, then I think that's proper. So I think that I would urge you to be as specific as possible uh, in terms of the information being sought uh, and uh, also to bear in mind that the, the fact that we have to be reasonable in terms of the type of uh, conditions or preconditions that we're seeking to impose. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Again, it follows on from what, the, what Glenn was saying. It's getting some clarity about that. My only concern with the wording that Councillor Kilbane used is I don't know what the timescale for, for that work would be and what we're defining as sort of the plan. If it's sort of like a finalised plan which may take six to 12 months before the scheme starts, then obviously we're kicking it not two months down the line. We're kicking it a long, long way down the line. So it's whether it's additional information around how they will meet those conditions perhaps rather than actually saying the full detail plan, I don't know what, what we're binding ourselves to in terms of the, the level of detail they have to supply in two months. Thank you. Uh, please comment if you yeah, will, that would be helpful. Can I just come in here? I've just had a quick, me and Glenn were having a confer there in terms of what's reasonable to ask of an applicant in terms of 
the information to provide and I think in terms of everything that you've just requested in terms of all those conditions wouldn't necessarily be reasonable but what we can do is go away and work with the Environment Agency to bring you as much information from everything that we've just debated about here in terms of the management strategy you want more information regarding that and the mitigation strategy you want more information regarding that. I also picked up that you want to know if this has been done by the Environment Agency elsewhere in the country and have they got any examples of that and can they go away and look at that inf information and also in terms of any funding agreements that potentially they could discuss with us in terms of ongoing monitoring in the future. So they were the things that I think is potentially reasonable for us to go away and ask for. I don't think that we can go away and, well, that's entirely up to you, that's your decision, but reasonably in planning terms to ask for that level of information, it would be an addendum to an environmental statement, it would need re-advertising, it would be a long-term thing that we would have to work with the Environment Agency. You wouldn't be getting that back quickly, is my, guide, my advice to you. Councillor Fenton. And <clears throat> just to follow on from that, I'm not sure if we were to re receive this additional information, would, would we then bat it back and say, there's not enough? we're not satisfied with it, and then we get into a, you know, I don't feel as though I'm, in a, I'm not an exp, expert enough to know whether a management plan submitted is sufficiently detailed and contains, contains enough expert input. The whole point of setting out conditions to this application is that so those colleagues who are expert and to whom we as elected members can hold to account are in a position to work with the EA to, to make those judgments and, 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 and as I repeat for us to hold them to account as we will be held to account by the residents of York for decisions that we make so we have a responsibility and I'm, I'm happy to take that on I just think deferring on the grounds that have been set out won't take us any further forward um, and, and I would repeat um, my well we'll have, we'll have the, the, the motion as move first and then Take it from that. Councillor Douglas first. Thank you. Um, and it's just a question, really. Uh, is it possible that we can prioritise those reports and pick out uh, one or two that are seemingly the most important? Because it seems to me that some of the experts that we have here this evening around the SSI and the environment, they don't feel they... Have, be, have had enough information or interaction with the Environment Agency to give us all the information we need at the moment. And I think likely the high point of that one is the Tansy Beetle. I noticed that there was not much thought, there had been much uh, communication with the experts uh, around that. So um, is it possible to prioritise and ask for further detail on a couple of the reports? if you think that all of them is being unreasonable or not enforceable? Um, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, I think is a straight answer, pr pr provided that, uh, uh, Chair, that, that, that you're specific in terms of the additional information that you're seeking. Can I just come in here, just from conferring with colleagues in terms of the mitigation that we think we can work out until the Environment Agency have actually gone through a detailed design. We, we're not confident that we can give you masses of information in terms of the mitigation. There is potentially more information that we can get, but maybe not the level of detail that you're wanting in terms of a full mitigation strategy, because that has to go through the, all the Environment Agency processes. They've got to secure the funding. It's got to go through all their stages before they'll get to that point so yes we can get additional information along the lines that I've outlined whether or not it's the vast amount of information that potentially you're wanting I'm not sure we can get that at this stage but we can get I think as we've we're working out between ourselves as officers that we think that we can get the examples from elsewhere we can look at the funding agreements we can look at involving stakeholders and we will where possible get more information in terms of mitigation but I can't promise you full mitigation details because I, I can't think that we'd get to that point. Just quick. Just building on what you've said and what uh, Councillor Fenton has said, 
I think we can keep asking for more and more and more information. Until the detailed plans are in place, we don't know actually what it's all going to look like. What we do know is we've got a risk of, if we say, if we defer it, it's six, 12 months down the line. If we say no to it, then there is the possibility that the work's going to have to happen anyway, and we have no way of actually managing it, to your point, no way of actually pulling any levers, and we leave ourselves open to Shipton Road being covered in whatever, and houses doing whatever. We also have a big impact along the rest of the flood protection happening around our city. So I just urge again, I know we're going to do the vote on defer or not defer, but I actually urge again that we support the application with all the, all the contracts and all the conversations that we've got behind where we say to them, this is where we hold you accountable. Point of order, Chair. We've got a motion, we've had a proposal, we've gone back into debate. That's fine. That's fine. So, deferral has been proposed, deferral has been seconded. Can I ask those who are in favour of deferral to indicate? Those against deferral to indicate? Seven. Can we just check that again, please? Indicate very clearly if you are in favour of deferral. And again, if you are against deferral. That's eight. I'm abstaining. So that has fallen. Do we have a further proposal? Therefore, Chair, can I further propose that we refuse this application? Do I have a seconder for refusing the application? Councillor De Gorn has seconded that. I don't think we need to debate it further. Those in favour of refusing this application, please indicate clearly. Those against refusal of this application, please indicate. And abstentions. Okay, do we have a further proposition? Councillor Fenton. Chair, could I propose approval of the, of the uh, application? Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Daubney. Can I second the um, proposal to uh, uh, accept? Okay. So we have a proposal and a seconder for approval. Can I just check before I put that to the vote that we are content to approve the application as it is without further amendment, comment, the one thing that concerns me most in this has been the lack of a joint supervisory body that would oversee the work going forward, and in particular the lack of funding to support the role of the City of York Council, the resources that would be needed, and as has been mentioned by others, the breakdown of relationships with a body that has incredible expertise, passion and commitment. I, I, would, I don't know if it's possible even at this stage to uh, to put in a section 106 that would require some help towards that monitoring function or even to add to this uh, a condition that there is the establishment of some sort of supervisory body. Is that not something that would be possible? It is. We would have to speak with the Environment Agency about that. What members could potentially do is if you could defer the decision to officers in conjunction with the chair and the deputy chair, and we can go away and look at potentially an additional condition or 106 in terms of working. Second, if it becomes a if it becomes an actual yeah. money, yeah. It, then it'll need a 106. If we get to a point where we think that potentially a condition is a point, I think if members feel that's suitable if you could delegate that to officers to work with the Environment Agency to seek to achieve something that way. That could, is something that we could do, but you'd have to 
delegate that to officers and chair and deputy chair. Okay. Just for points of clarification. So we would make that a condition that there would be a supervisory board or a condition that you would ask the environment agency if they wouldn't mind there being one. I think we'd have to work up the wording of the condition or section 106 depending on where we got to in terms of the discussions with the environment agency and what we thought best achieved what members I can get are trying to achieve through that condition 106. Further points of clarification so it, is, it, is it in your mind Councillor Cullick that that supervisory board would be uh, consist of all the main stakeholders? That I think would be ideal and that was what I was hoping my suggestion even at this 11th hour might achieve and I think might in doing that enable us to come to a, a, a more common mind on this because I think every one of us is conflicted in this. Um, we, we had a very I guess straightforward decision not so long ago as we've been reminded where we were looking at another triple SI but the proposal to build new homes we were unanimous in our response to that. This is a very much more nuanced, difficult and, and conflicted situation where I think that every one of us recognises the need to protect the existing homes, to pre protect the city and to work with the environment agency, whilst on the other hand uh, passionately concerned for protecting uh, the triple SI and wanting to do everything within our power to, to, to ensure that that happens. Um, Recognising the limitations of various kinds including funding and so on. Councillor yeah, I think a lot of the concern is around that level of delegation that goes to, to be approved by the local authority. I think that's what makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I notice a condition four at the top of page 51. It does say in writing to the local planning authority and in consultation with Natural England. I just wondered whether in all of those conditions, whether we could put something else on it that said something along the lines of uh, the local planning authority in consultation with key stakeholders or any kind of wording that could be legally enforceable that would bring more people into the sort of the overview of the actual review. Obviously the decision would have to sit with the local planning authority and we couldn't give any of those stakeholders sort of a power of veto, but we could instruct our officers to ensure that they are engaging with them as part of the, the finalisation of those plans. Question. Um, I think it would, be, it would be difficult to amend all of the conditions now, would be, would be my instinct. I think that the, uh, 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 if I understand the position correctly and what the um, chair was saying, uh, is that the, 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 the resolution or, or the, the decision which is, is being considered would be to approve, subject to the addition of an additional condition, a further condition, regarding liaison between the local planning authority and stakeholders, the applicant and stakeholders, specifically the Friends of Rawcliffe Meadow, uh, and the acceptability or approval of that condition uh, would be delegated to officers in conjunction with chair and vice chair of this committee. I think that works uh, from a legal planning point of view, uh, it has the requisite clarity. I think it's more problematic to, to, to try and revise all of the conditions. If that's what was being proposed, I, don't, I don't need to understand a bit more. It was literally to add a couple of words at the end of it. Oh. So take, for example, condition six, where it says the Tansy Beetle mitigation strategy has been submitted to and improved in writing by the local authority to add in after that in consultation with key stakeholders. But we would, we would need to know who identify the key stakeholders. Would you repeat again the additional condition as you expressed it a moment ago? So, so I and I will then put that to the committee. My, my understanding of, the, of, of the, the, the motion that's been put is that uh, members are minded to approve the application as submitted, subject to the uh, uh, addition of a further condition. Uh, that further condition would relate to um, deal with the management and liaison of the mitigation of the development. And the precise wording of that condition would be delegated to officers to be approved in conjunction with uh, the chair and vice chair of this committee. Sorry, that's not the most succinct uh, resolution I've ever got with that. Well, I think we all understand what we're, what we're saying. Well, thank you. Given that I proposed that from the chair, and I think that Councillor Pavlovic seconded that, um, 
then I would move, move that as approval with that condition. Would you please indicate clearly if you would approve with that condition? Thank you. Those against? I don't think there were abstentions. That is approved with that condition. Thank you. There are two elements to this application, as you realize, and as I said right at the beginning, we would need to vote on them separately. So with regard to item 4B, and the Clifton Ings flood alleviation barrier to the south of Shipton Road. Those in favour? Ah, please clarify for me. You need to move the resolution. Yes. Councillor Fenton. Could, could I move approval of the, rec of the proposal Thank of you. item 4B? Do we have a seconder? <laughs> no. <laughs> Councillor Hollier, I think. I'm happy to second approval of. Okay. Then we have a motion to approve, which has been seconded in relation to item 4B. Please indicate if you approve. Thank you. Those against? Again, I don't think there are any abstentions. Thank you. Right, we have made that long and difficult journey. And I'm sure the uh, representative of the EA will have taken on board um, a great deal of what has been said and the passion and feelings of the uh, councillors around this table. Uh, as I hope the friends also. Um, thank you. Do we have anything else to do? There being no other business, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.